The young girl kneels down and cries out to her father, asking what it will take for him to love her. Should she become like Jeanette? And if she does, will he call her name dearly as he does hers and watch her with warmth in his eyes? Will he hold her in his arms without pushing her away? But the father coldly replies that such a thing won't happen until the day he dies. The girl cries out how she is his daughter too and was by his side much longer than Jeanette. But the father calls her a fool with piercing contempt. His voice was digging into the girl's ears, crueler than ever. And the reality struck her as her father confessed that there was never a day when he considered her his daughter. Clyde was heartless until the very end. The deepest despair, like never before, flooded Ambrosine's eyes. This marked the end of Lovely Princesses Chapter 8, Twisted Faith. Our female protagonist wakes up suddenly in the body of an infant, just after thinking about that novel. It was a romance novel she read because a customer left it behind. The title and the plot were tacky and childish, too. She wonders if she recalled that book because the princess who gets executed has the same name as her. She wobbles around, trying to get the book out of her head. A maid nearby watches her struggle with the rattle and tells her not to be a nuisance. She picked it up from the ground and gave it back to Ambrosine without even wiping it. This makes Ambrosine wonder if she is belittling her for being an outcast of a princess. She continues fussing, to which the maid lays her down and goes away. Ambrosine still hasn't gotten used to her small figure. She went to sleep after taking some sleeping pills, and she woke up to all this. And to top it off, she is a princess. The maid soon comes back and gives her the rattle back, saying they don't have the budget to give her more toys. She also tells Ambrosine that she won't coddle her if she starts crying, as she's busy right now. Ambrosine notices how rude she is, but she guesses not every princess is treated as one. After being an orphan in her previous life, it was nice to be reborn as a princess, but why did she have to be a princess that everyone hates? Ambrosine's father in this world was a real psycho. She even gets goosebumps whenever she thinks of his cruelty. According to what she overheard from the maids talking, this ruby palace that she's currently living in was originally where the emperor's concubines lived. In short, the emperor's harem. Or so it was until the day Ambrosine was born when the emperor killed everyone in the ruby palace. Her mother was a dancer who was invited to the royal banquet. She drew the emperor's attention and was deflowered by him. But then she was forgotten and died, leaving an infant behind, who was Ambrosine. Since then, the emperor has cast Ambrosine aside too, his baby girl. So, she was raised by the wind rocking her cradle, the maids of the ruby palace. To Ambrosine, the man seemed like a dirtbag leaving a baby like her here where he committed such a cruel massacre. Since hearing that story, Ambrosine has been having nightmares every night. But what scares her even more is the Emperor, whom she has never even met yet. Despite being born a princess, Ambrosine was unlucky. She worries about him going cuckoo again and killing her. The name Ambrosine got in this life was given to her by her birth mother, the undying Ambrosine. It was quite an extravagant name for an outcast like her. It's the same name as the ill-fated princess in that romance novel she read, Lovely Princess. Ambrosine, whose name means immortality, is supposed to mean her mother wanted her to live a long and prosperous life in the emperor's care. Unfortunately, Ambrosine from the novel faces a tragic death at the age of 18, and by her father, the emperor himself, no less. Moreover, the maids of Ruby Palace belittle her as an outcast, probably because the emperor never came to see her. Only Lily is worried about her. But Ambrosine wasn't resentful. Rather, her goal is to stay a forgotten princess, out of her father's sight, for as long as she can. She'd be set for life if she ran off with some ornaments from this room, so she hopes the emperor forgets about her. A maid exclaims how his majesty doesn't even think of Ambrosine, but she's surrounded by such luxuries. Ambrosine agrees because, no matter how bad she gets it, it's still the life of a princess. She is going to grow big and strong, steal some gold, and run off. But first, she must try getting out of the crib. Soon, Ambrosine could crawl around the carpet with ease. She crawls around, looking for gold. Thinking the princess likes sparkly things, she agrees to bring her a new one. The palace itself was luxurious, but due to the dwindling budget, she never got much to herself. Ambrosine's day in the ruby palace was peaceful. She was nervous at first, but when she didn't hear from the emperor for months, she thought he really must have forgotten about her. Even those who were always on their toes seemed to be at ease now. But with time, Ambrosine begins to notice some trinkets disappearing from her room. One day, Lily reads to Ambrosine about sorcerers. The sorcerer of the tower has the strongest powers among all the sorcerers in existence. The idea of sorcerers in this fantasy world excites Ambrosine. 
Lily continues reading that the sorcerer of the tower was so powerful that he could easily bring an empire to ruins. For that reason, they freeze their own hearts because such powers could be used for trivial things if passion overcame reason and emotion overcame rationality. There are theories that the sorcerer from the tower destroyed the kingdom before their Obelian empire. Ambrosian sees a man's picture in the book and points to it. Lily reveals it's her father, and Ambrosian begins smacking the book to where that damned blonde bloke was. The current emperor of the Obelian Empire is the hero who brought an end to the tyrannical, devil-worshipping king before him. But Ambrosian only sees him as a scumbag. Her father, his majesty, Clyde de Alger Obelia. As soon as Ambrosian hears the name, she is dumbfounded. The emperor's name was the same as the emperor in that book. Plus, she has the same full name as the princess from that book. Ambrosine gets shivers down her spine. She tries recalling the novel's contents. Lovely Princess is a romance fantasy novel that was a big hit online. As the title suggests, there are lovely princesses in the book. Among the two princesses of the Obelian Empire, the protagonist is the second princess, Jeanette. The princess is a beautiful lady with an angelic heart, and she is beloved not only by her nation but by the whole continent. And among those who adored Jeanette was her father, Emperor Clyde. To his people, he is praised as a hero and a savior of the nation. But in truth, he is a heartless man who killed his elder brother, the proper heir, and sat himself upon the throne. Jeanette was the kind of person who could melt the heart of even a cold-blooded man like him. Clyde only learned of Jeanette's existence when she turned 14. Her mother was Clyde's fiancée. After enraging him and losing her place as the bride-to-be, she died while giving birth to Jeanette. Jeanette's aunt tried to protect her niece from Clyde by hiding her away in the care of the Alpheus family. After realizing her existence, Clyde is cold towards Jeanette at first. However, the princess eventually managed to melt the cold, icy fort that was Clyde. Supported by her father, the emperor, she was married to Prince Alpheus, the best man in the empire fit to be a husband, and lived happily ever after. To Ambrosine, the whole plotline was cheesy, and she wonders what happened to the first princess, Ambrosine, she was the firstborn and the same age as Jeanette. Ambrosine's existence was announced to Clyde the moment she was born, but he leaves the child in the palace for concubines, due to which Ambrosine grows up to be a fragile princess, always on edge. The first time she ever sees her father is on her ninth birthday. Led by the lights and the noise of the banquet, Ambrosine leaves the Ruby Palace late that night, where she meets Clyde in the garden of the Emperor's Palace. But of course, Clyde turns away and leaves, uninterested. But to a girl like Ambrosine, who's never received any affection, this was quite a fateful encounter. She tries with all her might to be loved by her father, thus growing up into a beauty with both skill and grace. And on the day of Ambrosine's debutante, when she turned 14, her dream got shattered into pieces. Ambrosine, with her gloomy and foggy disposition, and Jeanette, bright and cheery as the sun. Perhaps it was inevitable that everyone loved Jeanette more than Ambrosine. Instead of being jealous of Jeanette, Ambrosine teaches her the ways of the palace. But she ends up losing the very thing she ever wanted, Jeanette, her father's love. On top of everything, the poor princess gets killed by her own father after being accused of putting poison in Jeanette's glass. She was framed by Jeanette's aunt, an elaborate scheme to make her niece the first heir to the throne. But it was unnecessary, considering Clyde didn't give Ambrosine a single thought about the seat in the first place. On the contrary, Ambrosine would have gladly drunk the poison glass herself to save Janet, and avoid her father being sad. It was all because Ambrosine was a poor, foolish princess. Ambrosine was killed by Clyde before she was found guilty. It was her 18th birthday, exactly nine years after the day she met him for the first time in the garden. Eventually the truth was revealed, but Clyde never felt an ounce of guilt or regret for killing his first daughter. Jeanette suffers from guilt until she is comforted in the arms of her fiancé and puts the ordeal behind her. Our protagonist just doesn't get why Ambrosine had to die such a meaningless death. It's not that she really liked Ambrosine, but she just can't stand by and watch. But now, it seems she has become that very Ambrosine. Annalise begins to wail in frustration. Lily hears the princess and runs to her to coddle her. Lily York is the only person in the novel who claims Ambrosine is innocent. And for that, she also gets killed at the hands of Clyde. Despite being aware of the Ruby Palace incident, she still volunteers to become Ambrosine's nanny. The reason was Ambrosine's mother. She always admired how Diana's spirit was as free as a bird. But Diana died right after giving birth. Lily doesn't get what's wrong with the princess and tries her best to console her. But Ambrosine now knows she needs to make haste and leave the palace as quickly as possible. Time flowed like water, and soon, Ambrosine turned five years old. 
After years of effort, she has turned the maids to her side, who now have come to adore her. She doesn't want them to be against her, and she has come to realize she wasn't imagining things when she noticed the fineries missing from her room. Everyone in the palace is of noble blood, but the people of Ruby Palace are not really from the noblest families. They only looked out for themselves at first, but as time went by, they eventually realized Clyde had no interest in Ambrosine or the Ruby Palace. Ambrosine was as helpful as a scarecrow in a field, as they pecked at the Ruby Palace's budget little by little. Ambrosine was the only one there, so they had nothing to be scared of. They became so bold that they were stealing jewels and ornaments from the walls. All this concluded with Lily fighting with the head maid on Ambrosine's behalf. But the fineries the maids returned when they left the palace never made their way back to Ambrosine. On the bright side, she got to hide a lot of goodies without Lily getting suspicious. Ambrosine goes out to pick flowers out in the garden. The Ruby Palace is known for its beautiful scenery, but it doesn't seem like a good place to raise a kid. As Ambrosine wipes her chocolate-stained hands in the fountain, she sees her reflection and finds herself adorable. She is the spitting image of her mother, but those unique eyes are from her father. Jeweled eyes are only possessed by those of direct lineage to the Imperial family. The people of this world all have some amount of magical power, but the Imperial family has a very unique type of magic. Hence, eyes like this. Everyone says Ambrosine is the only one with Clyde's eyes, but there's Jeanette too. While picking up flowers, Ambrosine finds herself far away from the Ruby Palace. She instead finds another building, but nobody is around. She gets a brilliant idea and decides to use it if no one is here. She was wondering where she could hide the riches for her future escape. She now chooses this empty palace as her secret hiding place. Ambrosine was wondering what happened to her previous body and whether she overdosed on the sleeping pills that resulted in her death. She was an orphan, so it's not like she left anything behind and hopes never to go back. Ignoring the part where she dies, Princess Ambrosine's life is like heaven on earth. There's food, no need to earn money, and she owns real estate. And maybe it's because she was reborn. But learning the language wasn't difficult either. This world doesn't seem to teach reading and writing at an early age. So, when Ambrosine wrote down some letters, she was praised as an intellectual. And thus came forth her early education. While Lily leaves her the next time to get some milk for her, Ambrosine takes the opportunity to take out her riches from under the bed. She then struggles to bind them to her little legs. She had heard the whole palace would be clean soon, so she couldn't afford to lose her pretties. It's heavy, but she has no choice and has decided to go back and forth a few times like this. After Lily puts her to bed for a nap and leaves, Ambrosine discreetly sneaks out without anyone noticing. She pants as she dashes towards her secret hideout. She knew hiding it inside the building would be troublesome, so she decided to hide it under a tree. However, she doesn't have anything to dig with, and if she gets caught with dirty hands, Lily will find out. She then decides to keep the stash hidden and come back tomorrow to bury it. She could ask Hannah for a toy shovel, too. Ambrosine runs back at full speed and makes it too bad, puffing frantically before Lily can enter her room. Lily notices how she is sweating, to which Ambrosine says the room is hot. Lily observes how summer has arrived and decides to put up the curtains tomorrow. After that, Ambrosine ran out of the Ruby Palace a few more times, once every few days, so she didn't get caught. Though she is happy with how she's living right now and wants to stay like this forever, within these walls lives a ticking time bomb named Clyde. So, these pretty things were her backup for that dreaded day. This time, Ambrosine decides to head towards the building and, as usual, doesn't see a single soul. She finds the palace adorned with gold pretties, unlike her marble palace. She decides to sneak one, unaware of someone approaching him. Ambrosine flinches in surprise as a man coldly asks what a filthy bug is doing in his palace. Ambrosine turns around to find a man standing there with his knight. She drops her stash in surprise, which reveals her pretties. The man's jeweled eyes and face make her realize he is none other than Clyde de Alger Obelia, and Ambrosine's face turns pale. Seeing Ambrosine reminds Clyde of the dancer from Siadana, and he remarks that she looks like that wench. Ambrosine panics and wonders what Clyde is doing here, considering she must meet him when she's nine, not five. Clyde lifts her chin, saying it doesn't matter where she came from. He says he remembers that wench named her Ambrosine, making her heart pound louder than ever. Clyde continues, saying that back then, she was a tiny bug that couldn't even lift its head. In the Obelian Empire, a name related to immortality is only permitted to an official heir to the throne, and it can only be granted by the Emperor himself. On the day of the Ruby Palace Massacre, Clyde was planning to kill Ambrosine, but the heir's name that Diana gave her daughter seemed amusing to him, and he wondered how long she could live in accordance with its name. 
Clyde crouches down to her level, remarking that she has grown a lot. Ambrosian trembles, wondering why he is paying attention to her. Just then, another sack of Ambrosian's pretties untied from her thigh and dropped to the floor. All eyes turned to it, and Ambrosian's eyes widened as she saw her numbers seven and eight bags roll away. Clyde cracks a fallen ruby below his feet and picks up Ambrosian. He glares at her curiously and comments that she's heavy and has chubby cheeks. This makes Ambrosian pissed, and she curses at him internally. Clyde then asks what she is doing in his palace, shocking Ambrosine. She definitely did not know this was his palace, one that was even humbler than the Ruby Palace. She realizes that the reason nine-year-old Ambrosine entered the Emperor's Palace was because it was this close. Clyde glances at the Gold Angel statue where Ambrosine previously bit on it. Clyde's knight, Felix, remarks that she might have thought it was a toy. Ambrosine wonders if she is going to die because of that. However, to her surprise, Clyde tosses her towards Felix, saying she must have wandered off during playtime and telling him to carry her. He then remarks that he should have tea with his guest. Ambrosine is confused as she sits with Clyde to have tea. Clyde mentions that it is boring because she is unable to speak. Fearing for her life, she smiles at him, saying she can talk. Clyde asks why she was quiet until now, to which Felix whispers to him how little girls of the princess age are known to be very shy. Clyde makes Felix leave and turns to stare at Ambrosine. He mutters how Ambrosine's mother must have been ripped to shreds if she were alive for giving such a name to her daughter. It was because it was something that even Clyde, the emperor, couldn't receive. Obelian emperors are granted names that mean eternity or immortality. The mains are given to the official first heir to the throne. Therefore, Clyde, who was not the empress's son, could take the throne by force by killing his brother, but he would never be granted the name of an emperor, so there is a good chance Clyde may feel frustrated by her name and kill her. But Ambrosine has zero interest in the throne. Clyde asks her to eat, saying that if she doesn't, he will have no choice but to punish the cook. Ambrosine trembles and begins eating despite feeling nauseous. She forcefully smiles, saying it's yummy. She just wants to go back, scared of the devil before her. Clyde asks who taught her manners, and she reveals Lily. She becomes startled as Clyde reveals he knows Lily York. Five years ago, she stepped in front of him, requesting that she be allowed to take care of her. And so, the only two people who survived after getting in his way were Ambrosine's mother and that wench. But Ambrosine doesn't respond and quietly eats. Clyde then asks if she knows who he is, making Ambrosine tremble in fear. And she knows it's best not to take her eyes off him. She thought it was odd of him to bring her here. It was probably on a whim, an opportunity given as a prize for drawing his attention. This is a test to decide whether to let her live longer or to have her killed. Maybe nine-year-old Ambrosine was tested by Clyde as well and is just not depicted in the book. She wonders what to do for a while and then questioningly blurts out father. Let it be known that she has dug her own grave. But to her surprise, her response wasn't an epic fail like she had thought. She thinks of Jeanette being loved by the man and decides to draw his attention. She then calls him Papa. Clyde remains silent at first. Ambrosine smiles at him, calling him Papa again. Ambrosine managed to survive. But the Ruby Palace was thrown into chaos since she wasn't in bed like she should have been. Imagine their surprise when Ambrosine returned in the arms of the Emperor's royal guard. And the Ruby Palace's maids glared at Felix as if he were a kidnapper. Ambrosine doesn't help him since he left her alone with Clyde. But her eyes widen as Felix reveals that his majesty will come to visit Princess Ambrosine soon. Even the maids of the palace were shocked yet happy. As soon as Felix leaves, she empties out her stomach from all the piled up anxiety. Her plan of not getting noticed by Clyde and living inside the Ruby Palace until she dies has now officially failed. She was too naive and thought everything would be fine as long as she was careful. Ruby Palace is supposed to house concubines, not the Empress, which makes it odd that it is so close to the Emperor's place. Ambrosine's plan to save enough money to escape the palace before turning 18 was, however, still in the realm of possibility, and Plan C was to continue playing cute to steal Clyde's heart. But that seemed impossible. Ambrosine already knows what happens, according to the book. Maybe being daddy's little girl is pushing it, but she might be able to get close enough to him so that Clyde won't want to murder her. Plus, he did let her go after hearing her blurt out Papa. She kicks the sheets in bed as embarrassment from the cheesiness looms over her. Eventually, Ambrosine decided to carry out both Plan B and plan C the shame and embarrassment she will suffer from will be an investment in her future. The next time Ambrosine goes to the Emperor's palace is with Lily. As they greet Clyde, he remarks that he hasn't been able to pay enough attention to his one and only daughter due to his duties at the court. But he gives credit to Lily for helping Ambrosine grow into a healthy child. Ambrosine mentally tells him to stop lying, as he has been neglecting her. 
but she is surprised, as Clyde says he will now be looking into the princess' well-being. And starting today, Princess Ambrosine will be treated as a proper princess. But Ambrosine knew that in the novel, Clyde never admits that he never saw Ambrosine as his daughter. Lily consoles Ambrosine, saying that everything will be fine. A few days passed, but Clyde and Ambrosine stayed the same. But Clyde mentions that she got even more chubbier. Ambrosine smiles at him, saying he got pretty too. Clyde remains silent while Felix and Lily wait for the worst. So far, Ambrosine has met up with Clyde two more times and had some sweet and scary father-daughter time. During these meetings, Ambrosine realizes that no matter how pert and insolent she behaved, Clyde didn't try to kill her. On the contrary, the more she behaved like a scared child, the more formal and boring her answers were. But she still feels scared to face him. This time too, she survives, making her realize Clyde likes those who are aggressively friendly. Clyde has her join him at the lake. Lily expresses her concern for the princess being around water, but Clyde says there's nothing to worry about when she's with him. Though Ambrosine also didn't want to ride that boat, she had no choice but to follow Clyde. And so, as Clyde gets her on the boat, Ambrosine holds her breath in nervousness. Ambrosine wonders what to say to him and ends up complimenting his hair for being sparkly and pretty, remarking that she likes sparkly things. Her own comment makes Ambrosine wonder if she is obsessed with golden things because she was poor in her previous life. Clyde smiles, saying this reminds him of the jewel pouch she had with her that day. He assures her that he kept her treasures safe and sound, asking her to come and retrieve them herself next time. Ambrosine remains quiet, and so does Clyde. Ambrosine stares at what Clyde is wearing and wonders if it was from the Egyptian or Greek era. Whatever it is, he looks good in it and seems to be the type of man who easily attracts women. She can see now why they would get drawn to him. Diana really liked Clyde as well. Ambrosine remembers reading that from a spin-off of Lovely Princess. Suddenly, Ambrosine spots a blue lotus-type flower in the lake and tries reaching out for it. However, she loses her balance and falls into the lake. She struggles to stay afloat or swim, and she asks for help. However, she halts as she sees Clyde stare at her. This makes her realize he won't save her, no matter what. He's going to watch her drown like this quietly. Even so, she wonders if he isn't being too much of a jerk. She is soon brought out by him. Clyde then asks Felix to teach Ambrosine how to swim, as it would be a shame if an emperor's daughter drowned to death in a mere lake. On the other hand, Ambrosine fell ill and mentally cursed her psychopath father. How could he have such a look on his face when a five-year-old kid has fallen into the water? She decides to execute Plan B as soon as possible, as it now seems impossible to win the heart of someone that horrible. As Ambrosine craves chocolate and goes to the kitchen, she is suddenly approached by Lily, who informs her that her presence is requested. Reaching the palace's entrance, several maids greet her. Even Felix kneels in respect, introducing himself as her temporary royal guard from today. He reveals how his majesty intends to cherish the princess and treat her well. It turns out that Clyde switched out the old maids who are already working in a different palace, which makes Ambrosine upset. These new maids will be indifferent to her charms, and all her hard work has been tossed away. She, however, turns more upset as Felix happily reveals his majesty's desire to spend time with her at dinner. But for Ambrosine, it's much easier to die and be reborn again. According to Felix, the lotuses at the center of the lake are magical, monstrous creatures that lure people into the water to steal their energy. As Felix brings Ambrosine to the dining hall, Ambrosine asks the mister why there aren't ladies or knights in Papa's palace. Felix responds that there is no one in waiting because he prefers to do everything himself. And the reason there are no knights on guard is because there is no need. He then tells her to call him casually. As Clyde doesn't respond to Felix after he calls out to him, he thinks his majesty must be in bed. Though Ambrosine was annoyed, she was glad to go back. But Felix suggests she go in, as his majesty will be pleased to be woken up by her. He leads her in and then waits for her outside, unaware of how scared of death Ambrosine is. Ambrosine looks around and finds the room to be unusually plain. But there was one thing that caught her eye, a gold painting. Moreover, all the paintings on the walls were gold. She also paints a portrait of a woman, and Ambrosine recognizes her. She then turns her attention to the sleeping figure of Clyde. He really did look like a prince from a fairy tale while sleeping. As he doesn't wake up, Ambrosine wonders if she should give him a little wake-up punch. However, a chocolate piece slips from her hand and falls on Clyde's face, waking him up. Ambrosine tries her best to make Clyde fall asleep. She instinctively begins to sing a lullaby to him that Lily does to her, sleep tight. The moon smiles down on you. Goodbye to the day. The baby smiles at the stars, too. Tomorrow will bring a brighter morrow. So, dream a pretty dream and sleep tight, my child.
Clyde asks what song it was, and she replies that it's a song to say bye-bye to bad dreams. She then beams at him, wishing him a good morning. He says it isn't morning, to which she says good evening. He asks if Felix sent her in and gets up, sighing. He then decides to let them know to prepare their dinner here while Ambrosine averts her eyes. At dinner, Ambrosine struggles to eat with cutlery, so Clyde decides to send someone to the palace to teach her more etiquette. Plus, he explains that those she's learning from have no class, so it's time she receives proper lessons. She feigns a smile, promising to do her best. For the rest of the dinner, Clyde continues staring at her, making her nervous. At night, Ambrosine wishes to hear a lullaby from Lily. Lily sings to her, when the night sneaks in, pick some flowers for my sake. The pretty stars smile, saying goodbye to the day. Tomorrow will bring a brighter morrow. So, dream a pretty dream. Bye for now and sleep tight, my child. It was as Ambrosine expected. She doesn't compare to Lily's singing skills. On the other hand, Clyde ponders how Ambrosine is brazen like her mother. Felix remarks that Lady Diana was definitely the type to leave a lasting impression on anyone. Clyde says it would have been a year longer, and he would have forgotten the wench's face. Felix doesn't respond and rather shifts the topic, asking if Princess Ambrosine isn't truly lovely. But Clyde remarks that he lost such emotions a long time ago and asks Felix to leave him. Felix leaves and ponders. Though his majesty may say such things, he is certain there's still some left. And someday, he, too, will bathe in that bright light. A month passed by. Clyde changed his tea time with Ambrosine to the early morning. It was 10 a.m., and Ambrosine adorably greeted Clyde, who didn't respond. But Ambrosine has an unbreakable will. She continues playing cute while Clyde remains unresponsive. Ambrosine notices how he looks tired and is always sleeping. She notices the drink in his hand and fusses that he wants what Papa's having, despite Felix explaining it might be too strong for her. But Clyde agrees to give it to her. Ambrosine thinks it smells nice, and she likes the drink, exclaiming that it feels like flowers are blooming inside her mouth. With this one comment, both Clyde and Felix's eyes widened, and they stared at her. Felix sighs, saying it's called lip tea. His Majesty enjoyed it as well, and Lady Diana also enjoyed it, having said exactly what Ambrosine just said. He continues that Lady Diana was the reason why His Majesty started to enjoy lip tea, whose main ingredient is Sanu, which only comes from Siadama. But he gets interrupted as Clyde asserts he has no such memories and glares at Felix, remarking that he is surprisingly chatty today. He then tells Felix to leave them and tells Ambrosine to drink milk, as she's too young for tea. The scene shifts to Ambrosine drawing Felix, Lily, and then herself and the Emperor. She then begins to draw her mother after asking Lily what she looks like. Lily hides her sadness and responds that she looks exactly like Ambrosine does. In The Lovely Princess, she was described as a beauty one couldn't take their eyes off of. Ambrosine wonders just how pretty she was, even Clyde fell for her. She abruptly says that she wants to see her mother, after which a heavy silence ensues. This makes her realize she just said it out loud. Since that day, both Lily and Felix have been worried about Ambrosine all the time. This made her uncomfortable, and she wished they wouldn't be like that. She overheard Felix say to Lily that there are no memorial stones with recordings of Lady Diana in the palace. A memorial stone is a stone that holds up to 30 seconds of recording. Ambrosine has been sensing this for a while now, but Felix is oddly kind towards Diana. Even Claude's reaction back then didn't feel right. She then overhears Felix saying that he will ask his majesty to use his ability to pass on his memory directly to his daughter. But she knew it was too much of a risk to ask Clyde. She interjects at the moment, telling them not to talk about her mom with Papa as he hates talking about her. And what if she says she wants to talk to Mommy and Papa hates her too? And with that, things got worse and their worry grew even more. Felix assures and swears in his name that his majesty does not hate her or Lady Diana. But Ambrosine didn't want them to talk to Clyde, so she ran away. The next morning, she woke up tired after not sleeping the entire night. Things turn pretty awkward between the three. Ambrosine breaks the ice by asking Felix for a piggyback ride to the audience chamber. Seeing him interact with Lily made her wonder if the two had feelings for each other. As always, Clyde had awful manners, and Ambrosine had to wait for him outside. Suddenly, a charismatic man comes up to them and greets Felix. Felix addresses him as Roger, making Ambrosine realize the man is none other than Roger Alpheus from the Duke family who raised Jeanette until she was 14 and was also the father of the love interest of Ijkiel Alpheus. Roger Alpheus was quite an ambitious man, and he lived a very successful life with Jeanette. He greets Ambrosine after taking note of her, who calls her Mr. White, remarking that he looks like a white dog. She offers him candy too 
but when he reaches for it, she pulls her hand away while Felix holds back his laughter. They then leave to meet Clyde, and Ambrosine waves Roger goodbye. They greet Clyde, and when Felix reveals how they met Sir Roger outside, Ambrosine says that he looks like a white dog. This makes Clyde smile, but he hides it. Ambrosine runs to Clyde and is mesmerized to see the gold throne he sits on. Felix suggests that Sir Roger's son be Ambrosine's friend since they are of the same age. But Clyde says he hates noise, and it's unpleasant to even think about two kids running around the palace. It was too bad since Ambrosine was curious about Ijkiel. He was two or three years older than Jeanette. She gets cut off from her thoughts as Clyde picks her up in an odd position and comments on how heavy she is. He then places her on his bed in the area behind the throne room, saying he is tired now. Clyde lies down and asks Ambrosine to sing the lullaby from last time. She tells him she forgot the song, to which he asks what would make her remember it. He then reveals how, after he claimed the throne, some insolent men tried to attack him in this very audience chamber. He caught them and had them on their knees. Those fools kept saying there was no one behind them and that they didn't know anything. So, he made them remember it by force. He expresses how, from his years of experience, he knows a few hundred ways to bring back lost memories, but he can't use them on her. Just now, she acted like she knew the song, but now she is telling him she forgot it. Shivering, Ambrosine interjects, saying she remembers the song now. Just like that, she had to sing the lullaby song on and on until Clyde was satisfied and fell asleep. Felix praises her singing skills, saying it is hard for his majesty to fall asleep. He then apologizes to her for yesterday. She also apologizes. Felix confesses that he also lost his mother at an early age, who was also his majesty's nanny. So, his majesty and he are bosom brothers. He confesses how he resented his mother when he was young since she spent more time with his majesty than him. So after she passed away, he used to say he didn't miss her at all, and he really didn't think he did. He also didn't feel her absence very much because she didn't spend that much time with him when she was alive. But one day, by chance, he was staring at a handkerchief and noticed the embroidery of his name done by his mother on it. Unbelievably, he started to get tears in his eyes. This made him realize that, though he had no memories of her, she was still his one and only mother. Ambrosine ponders and wonders if she can really relate to this personal story as an orphan. But if she were really Ambrosine, not even knowing her mother's face, she would be treated at Ruby Palace, finally meeting the father she'd always dreamt of. If she were her, she would want to see her mother. But she assures Felix that despite that, she can sing Papa a lullaby, so she doesn't cry. Felix asks if she has a wish. Mentally, Ambrosine thinks of how her wish is for Clyde not to kill her on her 18th birthday. She tells Felix she wants Papa to like her lots and lots, making him chuckle. Soon Ambrosine feels drowsy and falls asleep, while Felix wishes her wish to come true. Ambrosine dreams of a pretty-looking woman and wishes for her not to go. Clyde watches her sleep and talks in her sleep. He tells her to stop bothering her and go to sleep. Two years passed, and Ambrosine worried about how her chocolate basket was empty again. It's like someone steals it discreetly. Plus, her charms don't work on Lily anymore after she gets a cavity. Now, her last resort is to go see her father. Though Claude still has his insolent ways of talking, he just lets her be. As expected, Clyde has many desserts brought in for Ambrosine. He then asks if she saw someone on his way and just ignores them. She understands he is talking about Roger Alpheus. She did meet him when coming up with Felix. He tried using her and kept suggesting she either be his son or his cousin's sick daughter as his friend. But, Ambrosine refused, on the pretext that she wouldn't be friends with someone dumber than her. One day, Ambrosine finds a raven in the bushes. She chases after it and manages to catch it. In the process, she steps on someone's hair. It was a boy with long black hair and red eyes. Felix comes to find Ambrosine but doesn't see her despite directly looking at where she stands. Ambrosine realizes it is the boy who seems to be a magician. The boy's eyes lit up as he saw something in Ambrosine, saying he had never seen the likes of her before. He reveals how the raven is a sacred beast born from her magical power. A holy beast is the essence of one's magical power, or mana. When it gets fully grown, it absorbs itself back into one so they may use its mana as they please. It is born when its owner has an overwhelming amount of mana, so they usually never try leaving their owner. Excited, Ambrosine asks if it means she's some kind of sorcerer. The boy reveals that she does seem to have some potential and thanks him for letting her know. But she stops as the boy takes away the raven, saying he found it and should keep it now. He plans on cooking it up, to which Ambrosine protests that he gives it back to her. He explains how he slept way longer than he thought, and his mana's weak. 
If he eats it, his mana will be replenished too. She continues protesting, to which he decides to postpone it till the raven is fully grown. He explains how he could have gotten rid of her right now, but he finds her likable and is sparing her. He then assures her he isn't a bad wizard and introduces himself as Lucas. He then snaps his finger, telling her to call him by his name the next time they meet. He then vanished into thin air, leaving Ambrosine perplexed. Ambrosine ended up keeping Raven. Seeing Raven ravenously eat her chocolate cake made her realize it was the real chocolate thief. She then meets with Clyde in the throne room. Felix suggests they both go for a walk, and Clyde agrees. Ambrosine subconsciously tugs at Clyde's clothes, thinking it's Felix. Felix explains to Clyde that it means she wants him to pick her up because she doesn't mean that much to him when her legs hurt from walking. Ambrosine tries justifying herself but halts as Clyde picks her up weirdly. As she struggles to break free from his grasp, he tells her to hold still. Felix explains that this way of carrying will cause the princess discomfort. He demonstrates how he should carry the princess. But before Felix can give her back to Clyde, Ambrosine holds Felix tight, saying she wants him to carry her. Felix smiles and obliges. However, Clyde says he will carry Ambrosine, as carrying seems easy enough. He asks if she doesn't want to be carried by him, to which she smiles and reaches for him. Clyde picks her up and tells Felix to move since he is in the way. Ambrosine remains absolutely still in his arms. Clyde asks if Felix always carries her like this, and she says yes. She says she can get down and hold his hand. To this, Clyde asks if she's saying that she wants to get down because Felix carries her better than him. He advises her not to let Felix carry her too much, except for when he summons her, or she will create a bad habit. On the other hand, Felix is made to walk far away from them. Felix suggests he carry the princess if his majesty's tired. Before Clyde can respond, Ambrosine slaps his face after seeing an annoying bug. She realizes what she did, and Clyde asks what she thinks she's doing. She tries explaining about the bug and blows on his face apologetically, as Clyde moodily scolds Felix for doing nothing as a guard except carrying his daughter around. He suddenly stops as Ambrosine coughs up blood out of the blue. Ambrosine feels dizzy and collapses to the ground. Ambrosine regains consciousness teary-eyed, and her whole body aches with excruciating pain. She cries out in pain as it feels like her insides are on fire. Even the Imperial doctors were unable to heal her, saying they couldn't do anything when her mana was leaping to and fro inside her body. Clyde locks the magicians for their incompetence one by one. He watches his daughter cry out to him for help. He closes her eyes, telling her to go to sleep since she's too noisy. Ambrosine thinks of him as heartless, but soon she loses consciousness. In her dream, she sees the pretty lady again. But she was sad. Whenever the pretty lady appears in her dreams, she doesn't talk, and the dream ends when she turns around and leaves the room as if she doesn't know her. But this time around, Ambrosine sees the lady being approached by a man. The man confesses that he has lost, and it feels as if he has been played by her all along. He promises to beg if she wants her to because if he doesn't, he will lose her completely. He tells her not to leave and to choose him instead of the child who's eating away at her life as they speak. Ambrosine abruptly wakes up to find the wizard boy from before by her side. Lucas remarks that she finally woke up and must have thought she was a kind of sleeping beauty. Ambrosine closes her eyes, making Lucas annoyed even more. She sits up and is surprised to learn that her body doesn't hurt anymore. Lucas reveals how she owes him her life, as her heart would have exploded and killed her if it wasn't for him. She asks how he knew she was sick and if he came to kill Raven. He reveals he would have already done so if he had wanted to. Plus, he stopped her dad from killing Raven. Just then, Claude and Felix enter the room. Ambrosine rushes to her father but manages to trip herself. But before she can fall, Clyde catches her. Rather than flinging her away, he lifts her up and asks if she is still feeling sick. Clyde asks if there will be side effects, but suddenly, the boy starts coughing violently. He remarks that he must have used up all of his power to heal the princess. Clyde assures him he will be rewarded after the princess is recovered. Lucas then reveals that the princess is still not completely healed. He apologizes and reveals that he is still a boy in training and wasn't able to stabilize the princess's mana completely. But the worst has passed, so her mana will slowly be returning to its place now. He continues coughing and promises to sacrifice his body to save the princess. Felix suggests the warlock rest before being questioned further and Clyde agrees. Ambrosine notices how he has turned smaller. Lucas leaves the room, but not before passing her a grin. Lily also enters the room and rushes to her side, saying that for the past month, she thought she'd never see her again. It is then that Ambrosine is told that she has been asleep exactly for 48 days. The scene shifts to Lucas telling Ambrosine how her dad isn't the son of Etarnithas after all. 
Ambrosine calls out him for being stupid and says Etarnithas has been dead for over 200 years already. Everyone in the palace was looking at the moron as her savior now. She had apparently collapsed because the mana contained in her body was running out of control. But there wasn't a single magician in the country who could heal her or even tell what was wrong with her. It was not until a young, gifted magician appeared. Lucas then reveals how his father really does seem to care about her. He tried to slay Raven the moment he heard that it was the reason she was dying. And it would have actually been more if he had since all the mana the holy beast was holding would have flowed back into her. Ambrosine then asks if this is the reason Raven has been avoiding her, to which he reveals the holy beasts aren't that smart and tend to follow their owner's tendencies, like how they both go crazy over chocolate. He then randomly asks if she actually wants to run away from here. She wants to hide where no one can find her. Plus, she also hates him. Lucas returns the raven to her, announcing that her dad is coming. Ambrosine runs to Clyde, but before she can speak, Lucas apologizes to her. He explains how her pet is a tricky magical creature, and she must decrease the time she spends with it if she wishes for the incident from before not to happen again. Ambrosine glares at him and gestures for him to get Raven out before her father really tries to kill it. Clyde leads her to her bed, and she falls asleep. Later that night, she wakes up to see Clyde by her side. He tells her to get some more rest, and that he will stay until she is asleep. She obliges. The next morning, Clyde tells Felix to keep up his guard and continue investigating the magician in case he turns out suspicious. Clyde remarks that he thought he wouldn't care if she died or disappeared at some point. He then tells Felix to get out before he can lecture him. Clyde was always waiting for the chance while bearing hatred in his heart and the urge to kill her. He always waited to kill her today, the day after that, and so on. He cursed at her mother, who left behind something that was the spitting image of her. He was almost done forgetting her and almost raised her, the source of her demise. He can never truly be rid of his hatred until the day he dies. Every time he sees Ambrosine, he burns with a thirst to kill. But still, he wants to keep her in his sight a little while longer every time. He continued calling out to her how much he hated her until no words were left for him to utter. As the days passed, Ambrosine grew more confused about Clyde's behavior lately. She did come back from the brink of death, but he had changed a lot. He even moved her residence to the Emerald Palace. The Emerald Palace has been the home of princesses for generations and is also the place Clyde gave to Jeanette in Lovely Princess. Felix continued nagging Clyde for letting Ambrosine have a playmate, but she states she doesn't want to play with Mr. White's kid. Felix reveals that he is planning on enrolling in a school in Arlanta and will leave. Instead, Felix arranged the young warlock as an adequate playmate for her, despite her protests. As Lucas ignores her, Ambrosine pouts and says she should have been better off playing with Mr. White's kid. It is then that Lucas flicks his fingers, telling her to do just that. Suddenly, Ambrosine finds herself in the air and falling down. She falls for a boy, and by his appearance, he seems Ijkiel. Ijkiel remarks that she's an angel. But before he can ask how she fell, Roger begins looking for his son. Ambrosine quickly hides herself as Ijkiel converses with his father, revealing he had been looking for Jeanette, who must have gotten upset since he left and ran away. After Roger goes away, Ijkiel turns to Ambrosine and apologizes for not catching her properly. He asks if she is hurt, to which she says angels don't get hurt by things like this and tells him to keep his distance, not wanting to show him her eyes. Ijkiel agrees and sits near her, asking how she ended up here. She says it's a secret, making Ijkiel chuckle. As Ambrosine asks him about the girl Jeanette he was just looking for and they converse, Ambrosine is abruptly transferred back to her room. She sees Lucas and punches him without hesitation. Dumbfounded, Lucas remarks that she is the first person to hit her. He turns quiet as Ambrosine makes him promise not to do something like that again. She turns to do her homework, telling him to get back to his history books and not disturb her. Lucas says they are no fun since they are full of lies, especially about the magician of the tower. And if he nitpicked everything, there'd be no end. He explains how they ridiculously wrote that the magician of the tower tore down the old kingdom of Obelia's corruption and purified everything. He just smacked them once because they were being stupid. Also, the part about how the magician fell for Etarnithas, became his henchman, and then hid in despair after his death. Plus, about how the magician of the tower hid himself after becoming hideous by accident. All were blatant lies and made-up stories. He proudly reveals how the magician of the tower has always been, consistently, the best-looking person of all. This makes Ambrosine wonder why he's getting so worked up as well as about the beauty mark under his eye. One day, Ambrosine asks Lucas to bring her to Alpheus' palace once again and also change her eyes. Lucas changes her eye color to red and sends her in a rather undignified way, much to her annoyance. Ijgil sees her and helps her up. 
He pats down her dress to remove the fireplace ashes and welcomes her, expressing how worried he was when she suddenly disappeared before. Since Ambrosian didn't get the chance to say goodbye, she came back again. Ijkil then asks if the reason she came here was to meet him. When she replies in the affirmative, he turns embarrassed and shy. She tests his knowledge on different subjects, and to her shock, he knows a lot, even on subjects above the elementary level. He truly was the male lead. They get interrupted as Jeanette appears at the door, asking her big brother to go to the greenhouse with him. Ambrosian motions for Ijkil to go, which he does, telling her to wait for him. As Ambrosian watches them go, suddenly, Lucas suddenly appears behind her, asking if the girl is a chimera. This takes Ambrosian aback, who asks what he is doing here. He responds that he came to see who she wanted to be friends with so badly and asked if that girl was a chimera. He then suggests they go after them. As Lucas observes Jeanette, he finds her odd. Her mana waves are not that of a pure imperial bloodline. No matter how he looks at them, something is mixed in. He asks Ambrosine if she knows the girl since she has her eyes, but she doesn't look surprised. Lucas cringes as he watches the melodramatic farewell of the siblings as Jeanette cries to Ijkiel, telling him not to leave. He then transports Ambrosine back to the Imperial Palace. Lucas asks why the girl seems like a chimera when she isn't. Jeanette is the protagonist of Lovely Princess. She is actually a child created by her mother, Penelope Judith. To be specific, she did actually give birth to Jeanette, but the process was artificial. Penelope was originally Clyde's fiancée, but she was never satisfied with him, who wasn't first in line to the throne. She seduced Emilius, who was the official crown prince. He had always regarded the talented and gifted Clyde as an annoyance, and therefore, he welcomed Penelope. Clyde had an unhappy childhood. The name Clyde itself means the one who limps so it speaks for itself. It was when he saw his fiancée cheat on him with his brother that he finally gave up on his blood ties once and for all. Later, Emilius became the emperor, killed Clyde's mother, and even tried to kill him by using black magic. However, Clyde managed to kill him. Before his death, Emilius did an experiment using Penelope, and she conceived a child containing blood magic. Emilius was always wary of how Clyde had stronger mana than himself and therefore wanted to create a powerful child who could surpass Clyde. As for Penelope, she died in childbirth, and an ordinary child was born, except for her jeweled eyes. And this is the story of Jeanette's birth. Hence, Jeanette wasn't even Clyde's real daughter, like Ambrosine was. But no one but her parents knew the story of her birth. After that, Clyde became distrustful and lived a depraved life. But then he met Diana, and Ambrosine was born. Ambrosian thought Clyde loved Penelope more than his own life. In the original book, he accepted Jeanette even knowing that she wasn't his own daughter, and he still kept Penelope's portrait. But in her dream, things seem different. She flails about trying to get rid of her problems. Lucas asks why she is throwing a tantrum, to which she tells him that he is treating her like a kid. Lucas agrees, saying she isn't a kid, making her freeze in shock. He says she's just older on the inside and precocious, like Mr. White's boy. But the meaningful look he gives her makes Ambrosine find him suspicious. Later, Ambrosine meets with Clyde and runs into his arms. She tries hard to charm him like usual, and Clyde asks if she's okay with having the warlock as her playmate or if he can find her another child. She says he is good enough since he sent him. Clyde pats her in agreement and begins to walk. Ambrosine smiles fondly and hugs him tighter. A few days later, Ambrosine heard that Ijkiel had left for Arlanta. He had told her to wait for him, but what angered her was how a ten-year-old kid was more well-read than her. This motivates her to study even harder. Several years passed by. The scene shifts to Sir Roger announcing and introducing Jeanette as Clyde's daughter to him in public at Ambrosine's debutante. The nobles gossip about how the pale-looking Ambrosine wasn't even escorted by her father. Jeanette's heart went out to her sister from another mother who was left there to stand, but there wasn't anything she could do for her. Jeanette walked to the red carpet to the place that was rightfully hers. This marked the end of Chapter 2 of Lovely Princess, the best debutante. With time, Ambrosine learns to dance flawlessly. As she meets with Clyde and discusses the day's events as usual, Clyde randomly mentions how her birthday is coming up. Ambrosine halts eating. Her birthday is the same day as her mother's death. On her seventh birthday, Clyde asks her for the first time if she wants something, and she asks for the maids who used to give her chocolates. Ambrosine was an orphan in reality. Not even Felix and Lily got to be as festive as they wanted that day, so she has never really had a proper birthday before. So she got birthday presents from Clyde, and on her ninth birthday, she started kissing him on the cheek. It was when Clyde handed her the key to the treasury. She still remembers how his face looked. Ambrosine's journey in the novel began with her first encounter with Clyde when she was nine. 
Clyde asks her if she really wants something like before, but Ambrosine shakes her head as she is now fully satisfied. Seeing him quiet, she remarks that she just likes being with him. He remains quiet and then asks her to finish her meal. Later, Felix asks her what she is thinking about her first dance at her upcoming debutante ball. Normally, aristocrats dance with their betrothed chosen by their family or a close, unmarried relative of the opposite sex, like a brother or cousin. She asks if she can just dance with Felix, making him choke on the air. He reveals he will be honored, but he cannot dare to, as she must have a more adequate dance partner. He suggests she give it some more thought. Later, Lucas calls her stupid, saying it's obvious her dad wants to dance the first dance with her at the ball. This makes Ambrosine ponder. She later goes to her father and reminds him that her birthday and debutante are both coming soon. So she was thinking about who she would like to be escorted by for her first dance. So she suggests Felix and asks for her opinion. Clyde says Felix isn't a bad choice and tells her to do whatever she'd like. Ambrosine reveals she asked Felix yesterday, and he said it will be okay if there's no one else to fit for the role. He says it's okay. Felix mentioned her debutante too and said this is a special day, so the escort must be chosen with care. So, Felix might be glad to hear that she chose him. Felix turns nervous as he sees the expression on Clyde's face. Ambrosine later pleads with Lucas to practice dancing with him, as she might end up dancing with her father at her debutante. The problem is his height difference, and she wants Lucas to turn in his grown-up form so she can practice with him. Instead, he gives her a dummy to practice with. After becoming tired, Ambrosine falls to the floor. She mentions how Ijkiel feels after graduating early from the Academy of Arlanta. It's been six years, and Ambrosine wonders how much he's grown. Lucas suggests she just go see for herself, and he transports her there. As usual, he is a scumbag and makes her fall from the air once again. However, this time, Ijkiel catches her as if waiting for her. He remarks that she still surprises him every time they meet and confesses how he misses Lady Angel. She asks to be put down, and he obliges. As they hear Jeanette's voice, Ijkiel pardons in advance and leads Ambrosine away. He leads her to his secret garden, revealing that this is where he comes when he wants to be alone. He then confesses how, up until that day six years ago, when he left for Arlanta, he went every day to the place where he met her for the first time. And after that, every six months, he returned to Obelia, even then and to this day. She asks why, since it was just a brief encounter, and he says he wonders why. And before he can say anything further, Lucas has Ambrosine transported back home. She tells him off, but he interjects, saying he doesn't know why he feels this awful. He then vanishes, confusing Ambrosine. Later, Ambrosine thinks of how it makes sense that Ijkiel has feelings for her since she looks like her beautiful mother. At first, she thought she was just imagining things, but it's hard not to notice when he acts like that. She wonders if the story changed because Lucas sent her flying at Ijkiel six years ago, and if it's okay for the novel to be rewritten this way. Well, a super pretty girl fell on him from the sky, and she must be his first love. Still, Jeanette is the protagonist, so he must not be serious about her. She pushes her thoughts aside, deciding to think about this again after her debutante. Later, Ambrosine expresses her worries to Clyde about messing up her debutante. Clyde assures her she can make mistakes, and if she does, it would be Felix's fault for not taking better care of her. She says someone might say some things about her. Clyde says that it should be the last thing they ever say. He tells her not to think too much, just dance outside for the sake of formality, and get out of there. Ambrosine then reveals she was hoping to make her entrance holding his hand that day. She wants her first dance with him too, and she wants him to be the first to congratulate her on her debut as a 14-year-old. But she feigns sadness, asking if she doesn't really like those kinds of things. That is why she asked Felix, despite wanting to go with him. Clyde hums and says that if she wants it that badly, then there's nothing he can do. Ambrosine hugs him immediately, expressing how happy she is. On the other hand, Felix cries in relief and thanks the princess for saving him. This makes her wonder just how much Clyde tortured him. It is soon the day of her 14th birthday. She gets gifts from maids, and Felix and Lily do their best to make her happy the whole day. After Lily tucks in for the night, Ambrosine ponders over how she had high hopes this time. Clyde didn't come to her 14th birthday either. It feels strange every time. It's not that she is sad because daddy didn't make it. It's just that it makes Clyde feel like a normal person. It's good for her survival, though, that Clyde has a human side to him. She gets interrupted by her thoughts as Lucas enters the room through the window. He has been coming to see her for the past six years. She suggests they go see Raven as her birthday gift, and he annoyingly agrees. She plays with Raven while Lucas watches, after which he forces her to go to bed. 
Finally, the day of the debutante ball arrived. Lily woke her up at the crack of dawn, and Ambrosian was surrounded by her maids, who helped her get ready for the big day ahead. Their worries made her realize she's been taking the debutante away too lightly. Ambrosian is soon done getting ready, and the maids are awestruck by her beauty. They also fixed the tiara on her, and Ambrosian couldn't help but think of how insanely pretty she looked. Lily wished her the best of luck, and she stepped out of the room. Even Felix is startled to see her and compliments her. He guides her out, where Ambrosine gasps as she sees Clyde all dressed up. Clyde looks at Ambrosine, and his eyes widen in surprise. He remarks that she looks like she will be cold, but Ambrosine isn't surprised by his reaction. He reaches out his hand, complimenting her, saying that she looks really pretty today. Ambrosine smiles and takes his hand, thanking him. Reaching the debutante ball, Ambrosine turns nervous as all eyes set on her and Clyde the moment they enter. She has never stood in front of this many people before. She sticks closer to Clyde, who takes note of the situation. He raises his head and glares at the onlookers below. One look brings chills to the crowds, and they respectfully bow their heads. He suggests making their heads down like that until the ceremony is over if that's what she wants. But Ambrosine refuses. He says he didn't take her as the type to get nervous about such trivial things, especially considering how she was ripping his hair out and hitting her face when she was little. He remarks that she was an insolent little thing even back then. She tells him to stop teasing her, but gladly, she feels a bit less tense. As they bow to initiate their first dance, Clyde asks her to relax, as it's a day for her to have fun no matter what anyone else says. Ambrosine tells him to get ready to be surprised, as she's great at dancing. However, she soon stomps on his feet and twists her ankle. Clyde grabs her and twirls her around, making the crowd gasp. Ambrosine asks if he is okay, to which he says he is in pain teasingly. He remarks that he forgot she was a different person, no matter how similar she looks. She continues stomping his feet till the dance ends. After the first debutante, the other girls also danced with their partners. After the dance, Ambrosine ponders whether Clyde has seen Ijkiel and Jeanette till now. Her eyes suddenly find a black-haired man standing with Sir Roger Alpheus. The second song soon ended, and the next dance was danced together by every girl making her debut that year. For a moment, that mysterious man's eyes looked like jewel eyes. Her attention diverts as Clyde encourages her to go ahead. At that moment, what she abruptly blurted out was a sincere thanks. She thanks him for being here with her today, vowing to remember today as a very happy day. These were Ambrosine's true feelings. Even if Clyde no longer sees her as his daughter because of Jeanette, he was the first father she ever had, and she has loved every moment of it. This is the only moment she can say this so truthfully. She then walks away, leaving Clyde astonished. From now on, Ambrosine will have to continue tricking everyone in order to survive. She walks to the dance floor, saying bye to her father. She asks to join the other ladies for permission, which they gladly accept. As they dance, a girl's voice tells Ambrosine that the ribbon on her waist is coming undone. The thought has crossed Ambrosine's mind a few times. Will I be able to recognize the grown-up Jeanette straight away even if no one tells me her name? Now she finally knows the answer. Dazed, she accidentally steps on Jeanette's foot. Ambrosine apologizes and Jeanette volunteers to tie her ribbon. But Ambrosine excuses herself, saying she has lost the dance tempo. As she walks away, she suddenly bumps into another boy. The boy greets her respectfully and says this is the first time he has had the opportunity to introduce himself officially like this. He introduces himself as Ijgil Alpheus. He asks her for a dance, but Ambrosine is too distracted by her thoughts to dance right. She steps on Ijgil's feet many times, making her embarrassed, but he assures her that her steps are as light as a feather. She had only practiced one song, thinking she would dance with Clyde only. Plus, dancing with him was awkward because of what he did the last time they met. It's her fault too for falling for him, but why did he have to look so princely and dreamy? Her thoughts are pushed away as Ijkiel randomly remarks that it seems his majesty cares for his daughter deeply, as his back hurts more than the feet she stepped on. Ambrosine looks behind him to see Clyde shooting daggers with his eyes at Ijkiel. Ambrosine explains that her father is just curious since Sir Roger mentions him a lot, and she confesses how she too has been looking forward to meeting the famous son of the Alpheus family. Ambrosine observes how Ijkiel is acting like those times at the Duke's mansion never happened. It seems he already knew she was the princess. The song ends, and people cheer for them. Ijkiel plants a kiss on her hand and expresses how it was an honor to be able to spend this time with the princess on her special day. He looks forward to their next encounter, addressing her as Lady Angel. Ambrosine remains dumbfounded and frozen in one place as she realizes how he used to be so cute when he was little. 
Later, Clyde goes away to do some work, while Felix approaches Ambrosine and asks for a dance. Ambrosine agrees. After the dance, Felix turns pale and tells her to accept his apology if he did something to displease her in the past. She tells him that he knew what he was getting into since he saw her step on her dad's foot, shocking Felix. At least he wasn't the only one treated this way. Ambrosine notices Jeanette in the party hall which means Clyde is on another business. Felix sees her stare in the direction of where the Alpheus family stood. Felix secretly reveals to Ambrosine how his majesty ordered him a moment ago to guard her with extra care so that no other pests approach her. But he has no choice since it's her day, accepting to be scolded later. He promises to keep an eye on her and nudges her forward. And within a second, a huge crowd surrounds her, introducing themselves and asking her to dance. She was soon tired and found her father asking if the ball was over yet. He asks why she wants to leave so soon when she has been looking forward to this debutante for too long. He asks if someone bothered her or said something to upset her. He grits his teeth in anger and calls out to Felix, scolding him for not taking better care of the princess. He decides to return to the hall, saying it seems he has been quiet for too long, all while Ambrosine remains confused. He tells Ambrosine not to worry, as those who dared speak badly to his daughter will have their tongues cut off, and those who behave rudely will have their hands and feet cut off. He hangs on the gate as an example. She protests that nothing happened and holds him back. When he doesn't listen, she shrieks that she came out to find him since he left her alone for too long. She wanted to spend time with him, so there was no point if he left her again. Clyde's eyes widen, and his anger falters. She tells him to stop and return to the Emerald Palace with her since the ballroom is too noisy. Clyde agrees, making Ambrosine realize that they won't need to meet Jeanette if they leave like this. Felix points out how Ambrosine's ribbon is missing, and Clyde orders him to go fetch it. However, they soon get approached by Jeanette, who comes to return Ambrosine's ribbon. Clyde turns to look at the girl while Ambrosine's eyes widen in surprise. Jeanette returns the ribbon and greets the Emperor, introducing herself as Jeanette Margrita. This makes Clyde recognize her as the child Alpheus has taken under his wing. The thought that he knew her makes Jeanette happy. Clyde announces their leave and asks Ambrosine not to lag behind. Outside, Clyde takes the ribbon from Ambrosine and throws it away, telling her not to dirty her hands with it as it has been lying around the floor. And if there is anything else she wishes for, Clyde tells her to say so, as he can give her anything she wants. Ambrosine turns glum and wonders if she is the problem. She keeps calculating and analyzing but she can't tell what Clyde is thinking. On the other hand, Clyde recalls how Ambrosine said goodbye to him in the ballroom. That expression on her face still makes him ponder deeply. He was then approached by Sir Roger, who talks about how the Emperor greatly loves his daughter and hints at how if his majesty had more children, he would cherish them just the same. Clyde calls it a useless supposition, as he is sure that won't happen unless this child splits into two. He then hints at Jeanette making acquaintances with the princess, but Clyde shuts him up. Back in the present, as they sit in the carriage, Clyde congratulates Ambrosine on her 14th birthday and her debut. Ambrosine recalls how she told him to do that, making her chuckle. She tells him he's late, as she's already been congratulated on her birthday and debut. Clyde asks if he should then take it back, making Ambrosine laugh even more. Back in her room, Lucas approaches Ambrosine, saying he thought she would be crying and it would be fun. He pokes her head, making Ambrosine feel lighter as he says something smudged onto her. He then forces her to go to bed and sleep. After she's asleep, he stares at her. He had stuck around because it seemed like it would be fun. Plus, she will die if he just leaves her overflowing with mana like this. He wonders if he should just stay a little longer, and he thinks it will be fine. In the meantime, Sir Roger scolds Jeanette for making a move all by herself and showing herself before his majesty without a plan in mind. Roger feels the situation is getting more and more muddled. On the other hand, Jeanette thinks of how beautiful Ambrosine is, not to mention the Emperor. Roger meets with a man outside who remarks that things are turning out to be rather interesting. But first, he should replenish his mana a bit. Ever since, the debutante, Ambrosine, has been receiving several invitations requesting her presence at parties. She wonders if she can really go to these things and decides to ask her dad. She enters his office, and Clyde tells him to sit down and wait. Ambrosine always thought he was just fooling around but he does work pretty hard. She sees a little stone statue thing on his desk. Clyde asks if she wants it, but she refuses. He then asks if she wants to say something, but she says he seems busy, so she will head back. But Clyde says he isn't and orders Felix to handle the rest for him. He throws the stone at him, shocking Felix, and he advises him to be careful when handling a national treasure like the royal seal. 
Ambrosine's eyes widen as she realizes that Thing is a royal seal. Ambrosine suggests they go to the lake. They do, and Clyde reveals how she fell into the lake when she was young. As she touches the water, he advises her not to get too close to it. She tests him and points to the lotus, saying she wants to look at that flower up close. Clyde mentions how she was interested in that when she was little too. Seeing her twinkling eyes, Clyde remarks that she has a peculiar taste. He then motions with his finger, and the lotus springs up and comes closer. He says he will keep it under control, and she can admire it as much as she pleases. But seeing the disgusting tentacle monster, Ambrosian screams and leaps at Clyde, saying she didn't know it was gross. She asks Clyde to make it go away and flails about, causing the boat to eventually topple over. Both fall into the water, and Clyde brings Ambrosian out. This was a totally moving change compared to when she was little. He dries her clothes with magic and promises not to do that anymore, as he didn't know she would be so scared. Humiliated, Ambrosine says it's okay. In the end, she wasn't able to receive permission to leave the palace after she fell into the lake that day. He finds the nobles arrogant, saying that they are ordering her to visit them. So instead, Ambrosine invited some people to her own tea party. Even Jeanette Magrita was invited. As the girls gossiped about boys, Ambrosine realized they were really just average girls. The book Lovely Princess was so full of jealousy and torment that she was a little nervous. Lovely Princess is a novel solely for Jeanette, by Jeanette, and about Jeanette, so it was common for girls to approach Ijkeel even before they got a chance to be remembered. And any characters who got on Jeanette's bad side didn't end up well. Things started turning awkward as the girls started praising Felix who was on guard, and how he was the knight of crimson blood who hid tender passion under his cold interior. Felix was hearing everything and turned embarrassed. Ambrosine remains quiet, but the girls soon see Lucas walking by and point to him. Lucas approaches them and greets the ladies. Ambrosine introduces him as the royal magician. Before Lucas can say anything else, he sees Ambrosine glare at him, motioning for him to get out of there. He quickly leaves, but the damage is already done. The ladies were mesmerized by him and exclaimed how he had dreamy eyes, an aura of solitude, and an air of deep loneliness as he walked away. He's like a solitary black wolf wandering the wilderness. The tea party soon ends, and Ambrosine wishes them all goodbye while promising Jeanette to meet again after she requests it. Later, Ambrosine continued teasing Felix for his nickname, the Knight of Crimson Blood. She meets with her father, who is sleeping yet again. She notices how he looks more tired lately. She places a flower in his ear, making him wake up. She asks him why he doesn't have any guards outside his room. Clyde answers that he doesn't need any since he and she both have protection magic on them, and anyone who tries to kill them will die on the spot. She has tea with him, and they chat. Ambrosine also later goes to her library to find Ijkeel there. She calls him out for trespassing, but he says they are even now. He asks for her permission to come closer and do so before she can respond. But Lucas interjects, telling him to back away. Ijkeel soon leaves, but not before hinting at the princess about inviting him to one of her tea parties as well. Before it was even time to turn a page on the calendar, another picnic was held. Ambrosine noticed this the last time as well, but in the list of guests, she senses no political motives or hierarchy. Her father must want her to make real friends. Hearing the ladies talk about men again, Ambrosine discreetly leaves, wanting to take a break. Jeanette joins her too, and they converse a little. Ambrosine then suggests she join the party while she rests a while. Jeanette asks if it could be that she doesn't like her. Ambrosine hesitates and doesn't say anything, making Jeanette even more upset. She says that she never had girlfriends of her own age and isn't used to it, and how it's not because she doesn't like her. Jeanette says she feels this way too. She confesses how she has a feeling that they are rather alike and has been hoping to be friends with her. It's been described multiple times in the book how Jeanette longed for a family. She would think of Clyde as her real father and Ambrosine as her real sister. Though Ambrosine knows Jeanette is the reason Ambrosine dies in the novel, she can't help but feel her wariness melt away. Jeanette invites Ambrosine to her home too. Maybe it's because Ambrosine isn't as scared of Clyde as she used to be. On her way back, Jeanette suddenly loses her way and takes the wrong turn. She is startled as Clyde approaches her, saying she must be very daring to roam around the Imperial Palace as she pleases. Though she was inwardly screaming, she maintained her composure and asked if he remembered her. Clyde glares at her, asking if there is any particular reason for him to remember her. He realizes she must be a guest at the tea party and decides to look the other way. She apologizes, and Clyde leaves after warning her never to show herself in front of him again. Though Jeanette feels down, she encourages herself that her uncle will tell his majesty soon. One day, Lucas sneaks Ambrosine out of town since she is bored. 
they eat a lot and wander through stalls. In a restaurant, they meet Jeanette and Ijkiel. Later, as Ambrosine looks at birds, Ijkiel approaches her, asking if he knows her. Panicking, Ambrosine gives the bird cage to him and dashes away. The shopkeeper asks where the lady went, to which Ijkiel smiles, saying she flew away. On the other hand, Jeanette was at the satin shop and was left alone by Ijkiel. Suddenly, a man approaches him, asking if she's buying a gift. She replies that she wants to give her sister a gift, making him smile. Jeanette notices how the man looks quite similar. The man offers to help her decide and chooses a cut blue sapphire ribbon, saying if his sister has such jewel-like blue eyes like her, it would be a meaningful gift to her. On the other hand, Ambrosine wanders through the streets alone. She comes across an old bookstore. As she looks for books, an old man randomly tells her she is cursed by someone who wishes misfortune upon her. Ambrosine asks if he is a dark wizard, which he says he used to be but has changed his ways. She then asks what curse she has, and the old man says it is beyond his abilities to understand. He tells her not to look for dark magic, as he has never seen anyone end up right after using dark magic. Ambrosine then asks for his opinion. She asks if, if a child were conceived by dark magic, would that child also bear misfortune? The old man is surprised and says he has never heard of such a thing but the child would surely be cursed and would have to endure a lot in order to lift such a curse. The old man then remarks that a girl like her seems to have a lot to lose, and she must not come to places like this. He then kicks her out. Ambrosine becomes confused, as contrary to what the old man said, lovely princess definitely had a happy ending. But then, what happened after the book ended? Lucas soon joins her and announces it's time they go back. Ambrosine holds his hand, which he pulls away, telling her to stop. Ambrosine realizes she doesn't have to hold his hand to transport, and agrees, but Lucas holds it again. Ambrosine is surprised as she sees her doppelganger doll in her place in her room. She exclaims that it looks exactly like her. Lucas removes the doll and says that, though she is ugly, the real deal is better than the fake one. At the next tea party, all the ladies ride out on the lake, and Ambrosine happens to partner up with Jeanette. Jeanette uses this opportunity to gift the ribbon she bought to Ambrosine who takes it delightfully. Seeing the lovely girl, Ambrosine realizes the old man is really a phony, and such a person cannot bring misfortune. Later, Ambrosine asks Lucas for a way she can keep Raven, but Lucas tells her not to get attached to a lump because it isn't a living thing. This angers her, and she kicks him with a pillow, asking why he can't be more sensitive. Lucas trips her in order to stop her and tells her not to get so fired up, as he's going away for a while, and won't be able to see her after today. Upon asking, he reveals that he's going to find the sacred world tree. The scene shifts to Clyde staggeringly walking, looking for Jeanette. Jeanette rushes to her father's side, asking if his head hurts again. The maids gossip even more about how the emperor can now barely rule the country. Another man approaches and tells Jeanette to leave this be and go. The maids gossip about how they say his majesty has been cursed. Ambrosine wakes up from the dream. She finds a bluebird in her room. It was gifted by Ijkiel, who says it was a gift to her to remember their sudden encounter. It isn't long until the rumors spread around the palace and reach Clyde's ears. At their first meeting, Clyde mentions it and says the kid must have picked up nothing but bad habits in Arlanta. Still so young, and yet every action he takes is arrogant. Ambrosine assures her it is just a gift of friendship, but Clyde believes he has impudent intentions. Felix says it was inevitable that the princess inherited Lady Diana's beauty, and there will soon surely be a flood of lords begging for her affection. And eventually, she will meet a good partner and leave his majesty's side. Clyde tells him to shut up if he wants to continue living and orders him not to show his face while they are having tea. Felix leaves, after which Ambrosine pouts, asking if she really must get married, as she just likes spending time with her dad like this. Clyde says there isn't any law that says she has to get married. Ambrosine agrees, saying she then won't get married and is going to live with him until she becomes an old granny as he's her favorite person. Clyde averts his eyes, saying she says the cheesiest things. He tells her to let him know if the Alpheus brat bothers her again, as he will make sure it's the last time. The same goes for the other boys. Ambrosine laughs awkwardly, knowing very well that another gift will lead to someone getting killed. Ambrosine asks Clyde if she really looks like her mother, and he asks why she's asking him that. He then says he doesn't know, since how can he remember the face of someone who died so long ago? Talking about her mom in front of her dad has been taboo, and Ambrosine has been careful about it up until now. But she doesn't feel like Clyde will try to kill her anymore, no matter how bold her words get or how big her mistakes get. She then expresses her wish, saying it's something only he can grant. 
Later, Ambrus Ayn is with Lucas, who complains about how cheap and useless the bluebird Ijkiel gave her is. Ambrus Ayn asks how long it will take to find the world tree. Lucas responds that he does know where it is, to which she asks why he waited this long for it. Lucas is off to find the world tree, a tree that bears fruit only once every 500 years. Consuming that fruit can replenish his depleted mana. She suggests he just eat her mana to avoid going through the trouble. Lucas asked if she was just saying that so her mana might not go berserk without him. This irritates her, and she says she just said that because he's her friend, making him ponder. Lucas bids her goodbye after giving her one last mana tune-up. On his journey, Lucas ponders Ambrosine calling him her friend. A flashback of his memory reveals a man pitying him, saying that he alone was born with nothing and would die with nothing. But Lucas no longer believes he has anything. At Ambrosine's next tea party, Raven interrupts the company out of the blue. He scares the other ladies, and they back away. Seeing the creature approach the princess, Jeanette tries to protect her alone. But to everyone's surprise, Raven was revealed as the princess pet. As she pets him, a sudden static energy pulls into her, and she coughs out blood before collapsing. Before Felix can save her, a magic circle surrounds Ambrosine. On the other hand, Clyde is fulfilling his daughter's wish from before. He is soon informed of the princess situation and turns shocked. It's like Ambrosine has entered into a deep hibernation. Her heart feels empty, as if there's a big hole and as if she has lost something. She wonders what, as if something she once held dear has been stolen from her. Ten days pass by, and Ambrosine soon regains consciousness. Ambrosine asks about her dad, and everyone turns silent. After hearing what happened, she tries to rush to her father's side. It turns out that Clyde fell unconscious ten days ago and still hasn't awoken. There was really no way to bring the mana back under control, so Clyde risked his life for Ambrosine. Felix takes her to Clyde, and Ambrosine calls out to her father, but he doesn't wake up. He soon does, as she grabs his hand. He sits up and asks who she is. He calls for Felix, who reveals how he's been unconscious for the past few days, surprising him. Clyde thinks of it as nonsense and asks him why he let other people into his bedchambers without his permission. As Clyde talks rudely to the princess, Lily asks if she doesn't recognize her. Felix explains how Princess Ambrosine is her one and only child, his own flesh and blood. But for Clyde, he had no offspring. Ambrosine calls him daddy, but Clyde glares at her, asking if she has a death wish. He says he can tell from her eyes that she is of royal blood, so he must perhaps gouge her eyes out. He halts as he sees his mana in her body. He stands up, but his whole body aches, and he coughs up blood. Lily rushes to fetch the doctor, while Ambrosine trembles in shock and collapses. Shockingly, Clyde was suffering from amnesia. He spared her for some reason but under the condition of locking her up forever. Lily also revealed to her how Raven disappeared after the day she collapsed without a trace. Ambrosine recalls how Lucas did tell her that Raven would be absorbed into her, and completely disappear. Ambrosine turns glum. It was as if precious things were being taken away from her. In her despair, she seeks solitude by conversing with Jeanette through letters and finds it enjoyable. On the other hand, Felix tries his best to make Clyde remember his daughter. He makes him remember how even when he was holding him back, he shook off his hand and entered the mana storm, all for the sake of the princess. But to Clyde, the whole ordeal seemed ridiculous. According to the current internal and international affairs papers, nine years have passed. Felix tries his best to make him remember but to no avail. He even shows him the things he did for the princess and even the painting he commissioned at her request. But Clyde thinks the brat bewitched him. On the day of his birthday banquet, he has her summoned to him and is asked to kneel. Clyde announces how he spared a wench who dared make a fool of him. But when she toys with his mind, even on a day like today, he must do something about her. The nobles are shocked, but even Felix can't stop Clyde. Clyde refuses to acknowledge Ambrosine as his daughter or a princess, saying that what kneels before him is nothing but a criminal. He then ends the banquet. Clyde has now finally shown his cold-hearted side, the one who never called his daughter's name lovingly even once, just like in the book. He orders for the brat to be taken out of his sight, but Ambrosine asks to let go. She uses magic, saying she didn't permit to lay hands on her and saying she will walk out of here on her own two feet. She bows and wishes him a happy birthday. She then runs away through the corridors but loses her balance and falls. Ijkiel catches up to her and helps her with her shoes. Before he can ask if she's alright, he sees tears in her eyes. She tells him not to look at her like that. There hasn't been a moment when she has been okay since she found out that Clyde forgot about her. At first, she was just trying to trick her father to survive. Ijkiel promises he doesn't see anything, 
and Ambrosine continues to cry, wishing that everything will disappear like a mist on the sea. Meanwhile, Clyde barges into his room. His head throbs badly as he recalls Ambrosine's expression from before. Something seemed to be missing. When Ijgil returns to his father, Roger scolds him for running after the princess that just when she lost his majesty's favor. Ijgil tells his father how he always told him to act rationally. But today, for the first time, he thought all of that was pointless. Upon asking, Ijgil confesses that he doesn't have the courage to see her tears again and he doesn't have it in him to forgive someone who makes her cry either, shocking Roger. Roger says he wasn't involved in what happened today. Ijkil agrees but says that might not always be the case in the future, and if what he is preparing is a threat to her, he won't be able to just stand by. Roger says and tells him to just get in the coach, and they will talk about it later. Letters from Jeanette stopped coming, and Ambrosine was sure Roger had stopped her. She is then forced by her maids to take a walk outside in order to cheer her up. On the other hand, Clyde's headache was finally gotten rid of, and he decided today would be the day to get rid of its source. He goes out to the garden, where he sees Ambrosine plucking out the roses rather glumly. He remarks that he shouldn't have let her live after all. He then uses magic on her but is surprised to learn he himself has cast a protection spell on her. But he remarks that the one to destroy them all will also be him. Her face and expression all seemed irritating to Clyde. Ambrosine cries, not wanting to be killed like this, especially by her dad. Suddenly, she vanishes into thin air, shocking Clyde. She smiled, wishing him a goodbye, and left. Felix and Lily hurriedly approach him and ask where the princess is. He replies that she's gone and vanished right before his eyes. Angry, he orders for her to be found and brought before her at once. In the meantime, Lucas tells the tree how he feels betrayed by him since he didn't even keep one fruit hidden away from him. He has no intention to leave empty-handed and decides to use his powers. His attempts led to natural disasters around the world and heavy downpours. The princess has been missing for weeks now and is currently hiding from the world in Jeanette's room. Ambrosine had learned quite a while ago that she had become a magician. Magicians of Obelian Empire nationality must legally register themselves, even if they are not employed by the Imperial family. But Lily said they should keep this a secret for now. Plus, she can't even control it well. And so, she really did absorb Raven, which Lucas had told her back then not to get attached to. After running away from her dad, Ambrosine found herself in an unknown place. She started living a renegade life for a while on counterfeit money. She never knew being alone with nowhere to return to would make her so anxious. She thought it was what she was used to in her previous life. Ambrosine did go to see Clyde once, but seeing that he still wanted to kill, she continued running away. She met with Jeanette and started hiding in her room. She even once discreetly sneaked Jeanette out of town, where they enjoyed it. They bump into Emilius, whom Ambrosine finds suspicious, but Jeanette feels at ease with him. Ambrosine gifts Jeanette a bracelet from the stall, since she gifted her the ribbon. They then bid goodbye to the strange man and left. Ambrosine finds him similar looking to Lucas but puts the thought aside. On the other hand, Lucas manages to take a whole branch from the tree and leaves for the journey back, knowing the princess will be waiting for him. Jeanette finds her bond with her sister strengthening more and more as they spend time together. Though she feels bad for not telling Ijkil the truth, who had been consistently looking for the princess, she knows she should respect Ambrosine's wishes. She suddenly hears commotion coming from her uncle's room and finds the man before exiting. Roger introduces the man as a friend of his who will be staying with them for a while. Roger had met the man at the debutante and instantly recognized him as the former emperor. He knew he had to get rid of him quickly and save Jeanette. He calls her when he sees her with Amelius and suggests she go with him to the Imperial Palace tomorrow in place of Ijgil. There, Jeanette finds herself in the Emerald Palace's garden. She sees an unconscious Clyde there and immediately rushes to his side, at the same time as Ambrosine, who also came to check on her father. Ambrosine hides as Clyde begins regaining consciousness, and Clyde sees Jeanette by his side. Surprisingly, his headache vanishes a little, piquing his curiosity. Later, Jeanette dozes off and is woken up by Amelius. The magic had worn off from her eyes, revealing her jewel eyes. When he points them out, she dashes away. However, she later confides in him about how she's of royal blood. But Ambrosine finds the man way too suspicious. She investigates him but doesn't find him anywhere. Later, Jeanette is invited by the Emperor himself for tea in the palace. Roger praises Jeanette for doing well. She is also happy to meet her father. But during tea, Clyde suddenly fell asleep and never woke up. And so Jeanette excused herself, after which Clyde abruptly woke up. He invites her to the palace again, surprising both her and Roger. Roger just hopes things go well so he can get rid of Amelius. As Jeanette goes back to her room, she bumps into Amelius on the way, 
who points out how she seems to be in a good mood. She whispers to him how she got another chance to meet his majesty. Noticing how happy she is, he stares at her in wonderment. He says she looks really happy, to which Jeanette agrees, saying they are a family. When Emilius later walks away, he wonders who his daughter really takes after. Meanwhile, Ijkiel grows more suspicious of the strange man who suddenly began to live in his house and wonders if everything that is happening now is all just a coincidence or not. On the other hand, Ambrosian sneaks out to meet Lily, who immediately hugs her. Ambrosian says she can't stay and has to leave again. Lily reveals that his majesty has been desperately looking for her and is blaming himself for hurting her. He said he would welcome her to the Emerald Palace anytime she came back. Ambrosine is surprised and asks if her dad can get his memory back. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. On the other hand, Clyde was having tea with Jeanette. He has observed how his headache disappears when he is with her, oddly. Ambrosine watches them from a distance and realizes this is a scene that happens in Lovely Princess. She wonders if things would have turned out like this if she wasn't around. This is Jeanette's rightful place, and maybe she just stole it from her. Maybe things are now just falling back to their original places. She teleports back to the Alpheus estate but accidentally lands in front of Ijkiel. Before she can run away, he grabs her in shock, asking if this is really her. He convinces her to stay in one of the rooms on the estate since his father doesn't even check up on them now. She agrees, wanting to rest after wandering from inn to inn. Jeanette feels a little off, though, since she had thought it would be a secret between her and the princess. But now Ijkiel also knows. A lot has changed from the original story, and Ambrosine recalls that her original goal was to survive. She even escaped the palace as she wished, but it seems she has been considering her dad more as a real dad than she thought. Plus, she gets to know from Ijkiel that Jeanette is meeting with Clyde quite often now. Ijkiel once asked Ambrosine how she avoided being discovered when she was outside and she revealed how she used magic. There is a spell that can blur her appearance and make her look plain. He hums in agreement, saying it seems easy for her, and suggests she take a brief walk with him in the garden. He brings her to the place where they first met, saying it will be nice to have fresh air. Realizing he was being considerate, she smiles while Ijkiel is completely mesmerized by her and instinctively reaches out for her. After Roger's inquiry about her meetings with Clyde, Jeanette comes to realize that the Emperor hasn't asked her anything about her and has just answered the questions she asked. The same was the case with the princess, which made her worry. She unexpectedly confides in Emilius, who asks her how she defines family. She reveals how a family is someone who loves and supports each other unconditionally, making him feel annoyed. He asks her if she's certain his majesty will accept her as part of the royal family. She says yes, of course, since they share the same blood. He explains how it isn't that simple and asks if the princess would be pleased to know she is her older half-sister. She can consider her a threat to her position. She leaves after Roger arrives and goes to Ambrosine. She asks her how she would feel if she turned out to be an actual sister. Seeing Ambrosine panic, Jeanette gave her a quiet farewell and left. Ambrosine later worries about Jeanette getting hurt by her reaction. Later, Emilius meets Jeanette and gives her a gift as an apology for the past. He has hexes magically planted on it to control her. He thinks of how she will be fine, though it will ruin her soul a little. However, he finds himself unable to give it to her. He manages to remove the spell and then gives it to her. They get interrupted by Ambrosine's appearance, who comes to apologize to Jeanette. She accidentally bumps into Emilius and feels static collide against him. Emilius hurriedly leaves after getting hurt by the protection spell Clyde put on her. Jeanette empathizes with the princess, realizing she shouldn't have asked such intrusive questions since the princess isn't in a good situation right now. She decides to do something for Ambrosine. The next time she meets Clyde, she asks if he misses the princess. Through conversation, Clyde orders Ambrosine to be found, promising not to hurt her. Jeanette quickly shares the good news with Ambrosine, who goes to check out things in the palace. She sees fakes and begins following him using her invisibility magic. However, she underestimated him, as he found her immediately. He apologizes after seeing she's the princess, and has her guided to Clyde. Clyde asks her questions about how she has survived till now like a worried father, surprising Ambrosine. His head suddenly starts hurting again, and he tells her to leave and stay at the Emerald Palace. Clyde calls for Jeanette, after which he is successfully put to sleep. As Jeanette and Ambrosine later have tea, Ambrosine hopes for Lucas to come back soon and fix her dad. Just then, out of the blue, Lucas leans towards her and asks why she has such a long face. Ambrosine is shocked and yells. She asks Jeanette to excuse them and leads Lucas away. Lucas tells her to calm down and begins to tease her, but halts as an angry princess yells at him, asking what took him so long. 
Lucas asks what's wrong and why she's standing too close, but he stops as he sees tears in her eyes. He asks what the problem is, and she asks him to fix her dad. She explains how her mana exploded while he was gone, and she almost died. She explains what happened and how her dad bullied her, pissing her off. He asks if he should teach her dad a lesson, making her more furious, and she smacks him. Lucas first asks her to get rid of Jeanette. He then asks how her mana exploded when he checked that things were right before he left. Upon revealing everything, he decides to take care of the matter. He is surprised and asks Ambrosine why he's dying. On the other hand, Jeanette reaches home and reveals to Emilius how Clyde is suffering from insomnia. But when she's here, he falls asleep immediately. Emilius smiles in return. Lucas reveals how Clyde's mana is in a mess and it isn't ordinary memory loss. He uses magic to make him feel better temporarily. However, Lucas' magic suddenly disappears. He knows he can't interfere more than this. He reveals to Ambrosine how he healed Clyde's body, but his memory can't be turned back to how it was since this is a curse. It is a punishment that befalls those who use black magic. And it turns out that Clyde did use black magic a long time ago. The reason he requests that Chimera's presence is probably because of the mana coming off of her, and in that spot, she acts like a tranquilizer. After returning to her room, Lucas asks if she has any guesses as to why her father used black magic, and she is reminded of her dream. She tells Lucas there's nothing. Lucas reveals how Ambrosine's mana is a bit peculiar. Something about the nature of her mana reversed her dad's timeline back to the time when his black magic was alive and well. Ambrosine says it's nonsense and that time can't go backward. Lucas asks what's ridiculous about it when she has experienced it once. Ambrosine jolts up as a memory and her mind gets triggered. It has become clearer to Lucas now that his mana's back. The first time was bad luck, the second time, she gave in to despair. He wonders what will happen this time around. Lucas explains how the magician disappeared little by little as if triggered by something. But now that it has returned, if they break the magic by force, her father will die, making Ambrosine cry. Lucas feels annoyed thinking of how Clyde seems done, and if he's going to die, he should get it over with. Instead, he's just hanging somewhere in between. But he couldn't let things be with Ambrosine in the equation. Lucas recalls how the man in her memories also broke down after his beloved died, but he couldn't understand why. Lucas advises Ambrosine to stick with him for now, as he still seems to value her despite losing his memories. He explains how, though he feels his headache disappearing when with Jeanette, he will die anyway as the dark magic doesn't go away. He complains that he has to take care of her as well as Clyde now. This annoys Ambrosine, and she asks if he wants a kiss or something in return. Lucas doesn't get that she is joking and leans forward. She gives him a peck on the cheek, which Lily notices from outside. Felix balances her and looks inside, but he sees the princess sitting alone on the couch. The scene shifts to the past, from when Clyde was a child. He looks for his elder brother, Emilius, in a bad state, as their class will start soon. He eventually finds Emilius in the garden, constantly staring above the fence. He grabs his hand and calls out to him, asking what's the matter. Emilius is brought back to reality, and he wonders where he is. He had thought somebody was calling him. He takes a look at Clyde and sighs. His mother had vented her anger at him again. He ruffles his brother's hair and suggests they skip the class together. Clyde recalls all these past memories more after worrying about his family and daughter. On the other hand, Lucas has discovered his tower has been invaded, and the rat that snuck in messed up all his magical tools. He decided to search a little more for Ambrosine's sake rather than catch the rat. Meanwhile, Ambrosine contemplates how to bring back Clyde's memories. She thinks of giving him a shock, but her dad has protective spells on him. She and Clyde are soon joined by Jeanette for tea. Though the whole ordeal seemed awkward for Ambrosine, Jeanette and Clyde seemed okay with it. Jeanette presents the two with some chocolate she made recently. Ambrosine takes one, and she knows her dad won't take one since he doesn't like sweets. However, he does take one and remarks that it's sweet. This upsets and irritates Ambrosine since Clyde recently chased her out for making him eat desserts. This is obvious discrimination in her eyes. Felix, who is watching the scene unfold, realizes the princess has misunderstood. He later approaches a grumpy-looking Ambrosine and assures her that his majesty doesn't like Jeanette more than her. It's just that Miss Magrita is a guest from Duke Alpheus' house. His majesty isn't a man who shows his emotions that often accept in front of her because he feels comfortable around her, just like the old times, and he assures Ambrosine that the emperor will get better soon. Ambrosine understands and thanks him, as well as apologizing for throwing a tantrum. Felix sighs in real life since he has succeeded in following Lily's advice. A few days later, Ijkil comes to meet Ambrosine, 
and they converse. Judging from Ijgil's words, she realizes that he might still have feelings for her before she can talk about it with him. Lucas interjects and takes her away with the excuse that she has an appointment. Ijgil offers to escort her out, but Lucas coldly tells him to leave as he is present for this. He then caresses Ambrosine's face, asking if she has a fever since she's red. She assures him she's fine and tries to get him out before he can embarrass her further in front of Ijgil. They begin to leave, and Lucas playfully glances at Ijgil. However, Ijgil stops the princess and kisses her hand, expressing how he's truly grateful that she spent her precious time with him. He then promises to come visit her soon so they can finish their conversation. Lucas glares at him, wondering if he should just kill him. Later, Ambrosine busily braids Lucas's hair, stating she is trying to stay calm. She didn't think Ijgil would still like her, and she thought it was just a fleeting crush. He has been really nice to her, and most people wouldn't go to that extent to help someone. But Ijkiel has Jeanette, and they end up together in the book. She wonders how Ijkiel ends up falling in love with Jeanette in the book. Ijkiel was always there to cheer Jeanette up, take care of her, and calm her down when she cried, and that's all Ambrosine could remember. She then recalls a scene in which Jeanette introduces her fiancé to Ambrosine. One glance at Ambrosine and Ijkiel was mesmerizing. Ambrosine is immediately brought back to reality as Lucas grabs her hand, asking what she was thinking just now. Those man waves were something Lucas had never sensed before. He tells her not to give, as he will help her recover her dad's memories. Ambrosine turns confused and says she won't give up. Lucas knew she had a history but didn't mention it. Lucas teases her, asking if she is thinking of Ijkiel. But when he sees her face, he realizes it is, in fact, true. He asks if she likes prissy, pretentious guys like that. Ambrosine protests that he isn't prissy but rather a gentleman. Lucas grabs her hand and kisses it, asking if that is what gentlemen do. Ambrosine blushes, wondering what's wrong with these two. She kicks him out, while Clyde feels pissed for some reason. Meanwhile, Jeanette stares at the bracelet the princess gave her. She had said that wearing it would make her wish come true. Jeanette wishes she could wear it every day, but then her uncle and Ijkiel would ask what it is. She decides to wear it when she goes to meet the princess. She was truly happy and hoped she would get much closer to the princess, and his majesty. On the other hand, Ambrosine asks Lily and Felix if they have ever been liked by someone and how they could tell they liked them. Felix and Lily are surprised. Felix ponders and replies that it is perhaps when their eyes meet or when someone is watching him from a distance. It was understandable since he was popular. Ambrosine asks if anyone confessed, but he mentions how he is usually with his majesty. Ambrosine feels bad for him and then asks Lily's opinion. Lily hesitates and then replies, which usually means ending letters and gifts to ask to dance at a party. Ambrosine turns excited and says she never saw her go to a party. Lily says they make her uncomfortable, and she prefers to watch. Hearing this, Felix recalls how one of his friends told him how Lily York seems interested in him since she's always around him whenever the Emperor is away. But to him, it seems she was just using him as a shield so others wouldn't approach him. Felix is relieved that he didn't ask her for a dance back then. Ambrosian realizes that she has been so distracted with her primary goal that she hasn't been thinking about things like dating at all. She had been creating it like other people's businesses, and now she doesn't know what to do in a situation like this. She pushes her worries aside, deciding to focus solely on recovering her dad's memories. She suggests Clyde ride a boat with her one day. Clyde agrees, and Ambrosine also mentions inviting Jeanette in case Clyde falls sick. Clyde agrees and asks Felix to make the necessary preparations. But Felix notices something's worrying him and asks. Clyde mentions that there's a man-eating plant in the lake and tells him to get rid of it. Felix smiles, saying it isn't there now as they uprooted it a while back on his order. Clyde then asks if he doesn't think the lake is too big and deep and continues staring at the door, the door the princess just walked out of. Felix understands his worries and asks if he is worried about the princess falling into the lake. Clyde tells him to stop talking nonsense and leave him be. Felix leaves while Clyde continues thinking of Ambrosine and how she calls him dad. To Ambrosine's surprise, a bigger boat was prepared. This makes her wonder if her dad also forgot that he used to be thrifty when he lost his memory. They set off, and Jeanette admires the lake. Clyde watches the two talk and suddenly dozes off. He abruptly wakes up as Ambrosine calls out to him after Jeanette has fallen into the water, trying to catch Ambrosine's parasol. Ambrosine tells him to gather out, but Clyde just stares at her. She tells him to hurry and leans over to see Jeanette. Clyde grabs her hand and tells her to sit down, or she will get wet. Ambrosine yells that this isn't the time to say something like that, as Jeanette's drowning. 
plight ends up getting her out of the water. Later, Ambrosine asks Lucas to teach her magic, and he agrees, telling her to be grateful since he doesn't do that to anyone. The scene shifts to a flashback. The Emperor meets the magician of the tower and introduces his child, Etarnithas, wanting to put him in his care. But Lucas called him trash and weak. He says he won't be able to do as much as a distant relative could, as even his jewel eyes are foggy. He then tells the Emperor to get it out of his sight and not come here again. Lucas recalls this memory and realizes it was around the time he gave up on protecting the tower and fell asleep. He tells Ambrosine that, royal or not, he won't tolerate dimwits like Etarnithas. Ambrosine mentions that Etarnithas was the most powerful emperor in history, surprising him. This makes her wonder just how old he is. He begins his lecture, and the first task he gives her is to try to stop her mana from leaking. He demonstrates that she should just grab her mana and go whoosh. Ambrosine thinks he is joking, but she copies his actions. And to her shock, Lucas says she did it. Lucas is surprised too and says that since a beginner got it on the first try, the idiots at the tower were the problem after all. He then mentions how she's like her father, who also mustn't have gotten things right at first. Ambrosine protests that her father must have been talented and good from the start, to which Lucas asks if she even knows her father. Ambrosine later shows her magic skills to Clyde but ends up doing it wrong. Clyde advises her not to push the mana inside the object but rather to envelop it. And surprisingly, she manages to succeed. He smiles at her, saying, good job. To this, Ambrosine says she is his daughter after all. Suddenly, his head starts to ache, and he tells her to leave. Later, Clyde ponders how he has no memories of his child. He does remember how he had no intention of accepting her, but he just couldn't kill her back then. He used forbidden magic to obliterate his feelings and even forget her existence. His beloved had told him to take care of the child, but he discarded it, yet she was still by his side. No matter how many times he pushes her away, she doesn't tire out or give up. He recalls Diana and how she refused to give up on him, saying she's his after all. And his daughter really does take after her stubborn side, it seems. Lucas informs Ambrosine that her dad is sleeping now. He wishes her a good night and ponders whether he should tell Ambrosine that her father isn't doing very well. As she lay in bed, Ambrosine thought of how her dad treated her the way he used to today. She had thought that they could never be that close until his memories got back since he turned her away so cruelly. Maybe she really was so preoccupied with trying to survive and be loved that she never really got to know her dad. Like Lucas said, her dad took the throne for his own survival. Yet he is diligent in his given job as the emperor. He is excessively violent and stern against aristocrats, but his subjects call him a great king. He committed a massacre in the Ruby Palace, even though he isn't a cruel man. He always scared Ambrosine and acted aloof, but he never pushed her away when she approached him. At a glance, he may seem full of contradictions, but Ambrosine knows there must be a reason behind all his actions. Her dad isn't just that cruel emperor from the book. At least, not the dad she knows. Then why did he act that way in the book? Or is that what dark magic does to a person? Lucas had told her the curse has something to do with her since he says seeing her makes him feel worse. This makes her realize that he must have felt that way seeing Ambrosine in Lovely Princess. And maybe the reason he kept Jeanette close by was because the pain from the dark magic was lessened. He never liked her in the first place, so he didn't hesitate to excuse Ambrosine the moment she was accused of poisoning Jeanette. It all makes sense, and it means Ambrosine never knew why he hated her or why she couldn't be loved until her very last breath. She sits up, wiping her tears away, wondering why she is so heartbroken and caring about Ambrosine, as if it were something she has experienced. Ambrosine wakes up the next day with puffy eyes, worrying Lily. She makes up an excuse that she just had a bad dream last night. Ambrosine thought about it all night and was convinced that the dream from that night was showing her what happened after Ambrosine died. She doesn't know why she ended up having such a dream, but Jeanette can only lessen the pain, not slow the dark magic that is consuming him. That's why he was getting worse and worse. So, Clyde eventually died. One thing that lingers in Ambrosine's head is the other guy from the dream, who somehow seemed both familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. The only thing that she must focus on first is figuring out why her father's curse was lifted before he lost his memory. One of the differences between Ambrosine and the book and her is that they met Clyde at different times. Then it means the curse was broken by having her around when she was young. Perhaps accepting her existence was an action opposite to the reason he sued dark magic. Or perhaps she was so cute that the dark magic got obliterated. Lucas sees her thinking hard. There are times when powerful wizards may foresee the future in their dreams, but he has never seen a case where they see what happens after they die. 
but with Ambrosine, it is likely that it will happen in the future. After all, she's a human who traveled through time and space. He reveals to Ambrosine how he found that it wasn't just one kind of dark magic that her father used. Judging by how tangled up his mana is, it seems like he used both magic to kill emotions and magic to erase memories at the same time. And he supposes Clyde really has someone he wants to forget about. And he can guess who that is, and judging by the look on Ambrosine's face, she has an idea too. Ambrosine knew her dad truly loved her mom. Everything she saw about her mother in her dream must be her father's memory. It turns out he was in pain to the point where he even wanted his memories erased and his emotions dulled. The thought itself makes Ambrosine cry. Since her mother was crying in the dream too, it's probably because she could understand Clyde's pain too. Lucas tells her not to cry, as her dad won't die right away, especially when he's with him. Seeing his expression, she knew something was wrong. She pesters him, and Lucas reveals that if her father were an ordinary man, he'd be too sick to even move. Still, her dad has plenty of mana and is strong. Ambrosine wonders how to make her dad feel better because, because of her, he's in this state. She asks Lucas why her mana got out of control, and Lucas says that's the really strange part, as he, of all people, sorted her mana. He asks if something abnormal happened back then, to which she reveals how petting ravens sometimes made static electricity. But Lucas says that's not the reason. He says there might be a solution if they figure out the nature of her mana, so she should just focus on her lessons. Previously, Ijkiel had rejected Jeanette and declared that he liked the princess the most right now. Jeanette had always thought she would end up with Ijkiel since even her uncle always hinted at it. But now things were different, and she felt all alone. She goes out for a walk and meets Emilius. They settle down, and in exchange for keeping each other's secrets, Jeanette spills all her worries. She reveals how she has been feeling distant lately from her uncle and Ijkiel. This makes Emilius recall a distant memory. His mother had made him promise to become an emperor no matter what after feeling belittled by her husband's lover and her illegal son. The next time Jeanette goes to meet the emperor and the princess for tea, Emilius jinxes the wristband she wore to initiate his plans. And soon enough, as he expected, Jeanette tearfully came bearing news that the emperor had collapsed. He later goes to meet Roger and tells him to start making preparations to enter the imperial palace, as Clyde will soon be announced dead. Roger is surprised and has no intention to participate in treason since the Alpheus family is on the side of Clyde. He tries his best to refuse, but Emilius ends up using magic on him to brainwash him. When Ijkiel later visits his father and reveals the news of the Emperor, he finds his father acting oddly, making him realize something was wrong indeed. Rumors soon spread through high society that the Emperor was gravely ill, despite it being kept a secret. Felix then suggests that Ambrosine act as the proxy of the Emperor to deal with state affairs and avoid creating suspicions among nobles, as it might be dangerous. She soon got dressed up and held a meeting with the council members. Though some try belittling her, she shuts them up with an appropriate response, impressing the others. However, Roger kept triggering her asking the reason for his majesty's rumored illness and if the reason might be the use of black magic. Ambrosine, along with others, is shocked. She wonders why he is making such an allegation, knowing well enough the consequences. If someone is caught using dark magic, they are locked away in a tower, and if they attack anyone, they are immediately executed, regardless of their status. Ambrosine snubs him and knows she has to end the council meeting immediately and find out if Roger Alpheus has real evidence or is just bluffing. She promises to look into the source of the rumor and punish the culprit severely. But before she can end the meeting, Roger's attendant starts laughing. He apologizes and removes his hood, remarking how he is just so proud of his smart little niece. Ambrosine recognizes him as the man from Alpheus Manor. But to her surprise, Felix shielded her from him, telling her to stay behind him no matter what. She soon learns he is the previous emperor, Emilius. She realizes why she couldn't search for the man before. It was because the previous emperor was erased from all the official records. But what is he doing here when he's supposed to be dead? Emilius does his best to cause havoc among the nobles and prejudice Clyde. But Ambrosine tries her best to handle the situation. Emilius reveals that he didn't die back when Clyde stabbed him and ran away. But seeing that the empire is in turmoil, he has decided to return. They later inform Jeanette that he is her real father, giving her quite a shock too. They then prepare to leave for the palace, and Ambrosine couldn't do anything to stop them since Emilius was a royal. Ambrosine goes to meet Jeanette later and talk. Jeanette asks if his majesty really used dark magic, saying her father seems to be not so bad. Ambrosine asks if she really thinks that, and Jeanette sadly says that she never ever told her anything. Ambrosine later confides in Lucas about what happened. 
he notices the blue ribbon she's wearing and senses mana coming off it, which is quite similar to Clyde's dark magic. After Ambrosine reveals she wore it back when the mana explosion happened and the ribbon didn't wear out, Lucas realizes that the ribbon was the medium of the explosion. Plus, the mana seemed similar to his, and he deduced it was Etarnithesis. He explains to Ambrosine how it wasn't possible that Emilius, who has weaker mana than Clyde, was able to successfully lay a finger on him, and reveals that the man is Etarnithus. They would deduce that the only way to save Clyde is by using the World Tree since it is known as the All Cure. Lucas shows her the branch he took by force. Ambrosine asks why he has to glare at her. Excited, Ambrosine touches the branch before Lucas can warn her not to, and she gets teleported to the tree. She returns soon but forgets what the World Tree told her. However, she has a prophetic dream of the Obelia Empire being burned down to ashes. With time, the nobles grew bolder to object to her, and the Empire's affairs started becoming chaotic. Ambrosine finally makes her decision and tells Lucas that she must go herself. Lucas hesitates, not wanting her to die, but he has no choice now and agrees. After reconciling with Jeanette and revealing everything to her, she leaves her with the will that she must succeed if she dies. She then also tells Felix of the situation, telling him to keep it a secret from Lily for now. She and Lucas then transferred her father to a better location for the process. According to Lucas, direct contact with the world tree is an act of throwing her consciousness into the nature of the world itself. It's like a drop of water that's falling into the ocean. One wrong move and her soul will get jumbled up, and she might even get lost forever. In the face of the nature of the world, she won't be able to distinguish herself from all the factors that make up this world. That includes all the people in the castle, right down to a blade of grass on the roadside. The entire flow of the world will forcibly dig down into her head. As soon as she forgets herself, she will never be able to return to her body again. So if she doesn't want to forget who she is and end up drifting around the world like air, she must pay close attention. He guides her to hold her father's hand and say her name. He asks her to make sure to remember her mana, her soul, and who she is. Ambrosine gets transported away and feels like her head will explode as a cascade of noisy memories passes through her head. She hears Luca's voice telling her to say her name amid everything. She does so, and someone immediately pulls her towards herself. Lucas sees Ambrosine's body glow, surprising him. He was wondering how Clyde managed to hold out in this state. Maybe it's because of this. Ambrosine stares at the beautiful woman and calls her mother. Diana continues kissing her daughter all over. Ambrosine turns shy after being baptized with all the kisses. Diana embraces her, exclaiming how cute she is. She tells her to understand that she has never been able to hold her in her arms until now. As soon as she learns that this is indeed her mother, Ambrosine starts welling up with tears. Diana consoles her, saying she has always been watching her and revealing how proud she is because of the admirable person he grew up as. She says time flies for souls, to which Ambrosine asks if she hasn't been reborn. Diana explains that what he's seeing is just a part of her soul, and she has probably been reborn somewhere on the continent, but incompletely. She thinks a part of her remained here because she was so worried about her and Clyde. She then assures her that the Emperor is well, as he's been with her all this time. He is aware of everything that's been going on outside as well as the situation she's in. She says she is here by herself because she wants to talk to her alone. She reveals how Clyde is touched that his daughter came all the way to save him, though he was a little angry. She then points in a direction, telling Ambrosine to go over there and take what she has brought. Ambrosine looks into her hand to find the branch. Diana tells her to thank Lily and Felix for taking care of her when she returns. She hugs her one last time, saying that though she couldn't raise her and hold her in her arms, never once has she not loved her. Lucas thought that, after living for almost an eternity, he was able to kill all those pesky emotions because of that damn tower. But why is it that he can't bear the thought of losing someone now? He still doesn't know how it feels to have a family, but he does know how lonely he would be if he were unable to see that someone again. Suddenly, the formula cracks, making him realize the curse has broken. He looks behind him to see that Clyde has woken up, but Ambrosine is still unconscious. Before he can say anything, Clyde gestures for him to stay quiet. On the other hand, Ambrosine wonders where she is. She sees her father's childhood filled with sorrow, resignation, and fury. His once loving brother turns into a cold-hearted man. She even sees his sick mother and how Claude killed Emilius, even when he met Diana. She watches their fond memories together and notices how, ever since her dad met her mom, all his memories have begun to shine brightly. The memories then start quickly flashing before her eyes. She suddenly senses her father's grief, making her feel as if her heart will be torn out. And surprisingly, it soon faded away. 
This must be the black magic. So her father really did kill his emotions because he couldn't bear the sorrow of losing her mom. Since then, he has found everything boring and filled with endless emptiness, a black and white world that has lost its color. But it is when he sees a small bag in his garden that he senses he has forgotten about something. With the time he spent with his daughter, the black magic wall started breaking down solely yet surely. It is when he sees her coughing up blood back then that the curse finally lifts. He started looking at her, wanting to do everything and anything for her just so she would always stay healthy and happy. When the mana explosion occurred, he jumped in without any hesitation, wanting to protect his and Diana's child. He apologized to Diana after he finally understood her. Ambrosine wakes up and smiles at her father. He later scolded her for risking her life for him. She does the same, and Clyde shyly reveals how her mother wants them to work things out and even scolds her for some things. Ambrosine reveals how she was hurt and sad when he pushed her away. He says she is right to resent him and will punish everyone who harmed her. But she interrupts, saying she doesn't want to hear that. She grabs him, asking if there isn't something else he needs to say to her. He apologizes and says he shouldn't have treated her the way he did. Ambrosine begins to cry, saying she hates him. He continues consoling her while she complains. It turns out her dad is just like her. Both were so afraid of being rejected that they built up walls and waited for others to approach them first. And so Clyde assures her to rest while he takes care of the snobby nobles. They all decide to settle the debts. They conjure up a plan, and Ijkeel agrees to help them. He is used to catching Amelius off guard and taking his blood successfully so they can prove his crimes in front of the nobles. They successfully do so and forcibly bring him to Lucas's tower. They also hastily summon all the nobles to witness the Emperor's innocence and Emilius' crimes. They are soon proven, and he is sentenced to the dungeon for now. Ambrosine allows Jeanette to meet with him, but they find him unconscious and hurt. He and Roger are both treated by Lucas. Roger's health was worsening after the brainwashing, so Lucas treated him too. He soon woke up and immediately grabbed Jeanette in order to protect her from Emilius. This makes Jeanette realize that her uncle didn't really use her and genuinely cared about her. Later, as Etarnithas possessed another noble's body and tried harming the princess, Clyde stepped up and beat the shit out of the man. Lucas reveals how Etarnithas has grown stronger by stealing his mana from the tower previously. They decide to end things once and for all. They head inside to find Emilius there. Clyde tests him by attacking Jeanette, which he shields her from. He realizes that Emilius has been able to dodge Etarnithas' brainwashing this entire time, but chooses not to because his interests are similar to his. Lucas apologizes to Etarnithas for being rude to him back then and promises to make him a disciple when they meet again. But Etarnithas has no intention to seek redemption and has possessed Jeanette's body. However, they manage to seal his spirit at last. Emilius gets arrested, and a trial is held soon. It is then announced that the former emperor will be executed in three days. However, Jeanette begs for mercy, saying her father didn't commit crimes on his own. Clyde tells Ambrosine to do what she pleases, and so she decides to forgive him. However, for the public, using Luca's help, a dummy is shown to be executed in Emilius' place. It is then decided that Jeanette and Emilius will be leaving Obelia and starting anew. Ambrosine convinces her father to at least try reconciling with his brother, and he does so on the night they are supposed to leave. It seems there is still room for them to start anew as well. Days pass by, and things turn to normal. Clyde and Ambrosine turn to her to plan her coronation ceremony, which will be held in six months' time. On the other hand, Ambrosine was also busy deciding between Lucas and Ijkiel. Both were charming enough to sway her, and she was unable to choose. She asks both for some time to reconsider things, and they respect her wishes. Even the unfazed Lucas does his best to win her affection by using cheesy lines from a romance novel on a dinner date and improving his speech. On one occasion, she comes to realize that Ambrosine has been a part of this world all along, and the previous two lives she has lived were all hers. Lucas even said that her desire to start from the beginning turned into a manifestation of her reincarnation. On the other hand, Ambrosine's constant distraction by the boys irritates Clyde a lot, and he insists he is still a baby. However, he later assures her to do what he wants, as he won't stop her. A day before the coronation, they go through all the necessary preparations, and Clyde smiles at his daughter, remarking how he can't help but be sad. This confuses Ambrosine, but she doesn't question it further. The day of the coronation arrives. Ambrosine is dressed up properly and goes down to the hall with her father. The nobles were mesmerized to see the hall adorned with luxuries, and it seemed like the coronation of an empress rather than an heir. On her way, Ambrosine asks her father what he meant back then when he said he was sad. 
Clyde reveals that just yesterday, she was a small kid who clumsily sued to follow her, but now she's old enough to have her own coronation. It seems she will soon find a partner and leave him. His words cause Ambrosine to cry. Clyde and Felix both turn worried and try shushing her. Soon, Lucas and Ijkiel join the party while looking for the princess. They shoot daggers at each other and bicker. Ambrosine continues crying, promising Clyde that she won't ever leave him or get married. Clyde beams brightly to everyone's surprise and agrees, saying that's what she wants. The maids touch up Ambrosine's ruined makeup again, and the coronation begins. She is soon crowned the crown princess, and the crowd erupts into cheers and hail. They later take a carriage to town where many commoners have gathered to see their new crown princess. Among the crowd, Jeanette sees a familiar face. She turns to her father, who confirms her doubts. It was Jeanette and her father. She smiles happily. After being reincarnated multiple times and rethinking the life she has now, Ambrosine has finally learned something. Family isn't always what it appears to be on the outside. The fact that they are a family doesn't guarantee that they will get along. She has learned that bonding, emotional interaction, and spending time together are all crucial processes of being a family. She thanks her dad but gets distracted as fragments of the world tree suddenly begin to leak out of her hand, shocking even Lucas. This makes her remember what the world tree said to her back then. It had cleared her doubts, assured her that her decisions weren't wrong, and motivated her to take the path she believed in. As the crowd watches the miracle, they once again erupt into cheers and celebration for their blessed crown princess. And so Ambrosine became the empress who would live on in history. That is how the lovely princess ended. The princess and everyone who loved her lived happily ever after in the land of beautiful springs and summers.